reporter. <laughs> Sorry, I think this went report. Um, do we have anything to report out of closed session? Uh, no. The City Council met pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9, subsection D2, in closed session, and there is no reportable action. All right, thank you. So my computer is updating. I have no agenda. <laughs> All right, roll call, please. Vice Mayor Farmer? Here. Council Member Sandu? Here. Council Member Campion? Here. Council Member Lozano? Here. Mayor Lampson? Here. All right, silent prayer and flag salute. Please stand. Whoa. One on your shoulder. Who's wearing one? Who, who borrowed the flag? <laughs> Got a tie. The tie. <laughs> Watch it. There we go. Oh, you're in the center, Mark. All right, let's have our moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's a little snappy. Well, that was awkward. Donna is going to, the city clerk is going after whoever took that flag. Chris, were you grabbing your agenda? Or just, okay. I've got Sean for now. But, all right, can you please replay the statement? This meeting of the Galt City Council will be cablecast on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will air Friday, June 7th at 9 a.m. and Saturday, June 8th at 9 a.m. The City Council meeting videos are also archived on the city's website and a DVD copy is available for checkout from any library branch. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Are there any agenda, approval, additions, and or deletions? I'd like to pull J2 and 4. G2 or J2? J. Okay. J2 and J4. Okay. Anything else? All right. We have a presentation. <clears throat> the Galt Area Historical Society 2018-2019 Community Benefit Funding Grant Report to the City Council. I believe we have Janice Barsetti Gray. Uh, uh, in, uh, I'm Janice Barsetti Gray, president of the Galt Area Historical Society. Uh, in 2018, the Galt Area Historical Society was awarded $6,000 of the community Galt Community uh, Benefit Grant. Uh, we applied for this grant to do repairs to the Ray House Museum, which was built in 1868. The Galt Area Historical Society received this property in 1991, and we renovated the house at that time. Now, almost 30 years later, um, it's, it needs some major work, but obviously we only have so much fun. So also due to the length of the rainy season and how busy contractors are in catching up, the contractor whose bid we selected had to finish other projects, but he informed me just a couple of days ago that he will be starting on the Ray House this coming Monday, June 10th, and will be done before June 30th. So, um, so those repairs uh, will happen, and you'll hear back from me before, or you'll get the receipts before the end of the month. Do you want to know some of the, the work that he was doing? Yeah, sure. Okay, so his actual bid was 8220 so we actually have 2200 out of pocket uh, to repair. We've got, we've got, and again, there's a lot of repairs that need to happen on the Ray, so we just had to, to find the ones that we could we could fund now and um, and do others later. So uh, we we have um, we have new gutters that have to be put on one part of the 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 roof. We also have some of the moldings have rotted out, and he has to repair some of those. And actually, what he has to do is actually make them some of the, the outside moldings. There's some dry rot on both decks. He has to actually um, take the wood out, repair the wood. Um, 
some of it has to be, uh, some of the rot that's not there, he has to cover it up, uh, paint it, and et cetera. Um, we have an outside light uh, source that is a security light that has not been working, and um, it, the parking lot is very dark, so he has to repair and replace that light. We have a broken window. Somebody has shot a, a BB gun through it, a BB hole, so that has to be replaced. Um, uh, we also have an outside restroom, a public restroom, that's used at the Ray House that um, because some water damage got in, we had some mold underneath the the linoleum that all has to be replaced. He has to has to paint something on the cement, and uh, so that has to be done. Um, then, of course, he has to haul off the debris. Uh, and, and again, we do have a lot of rot on both ends of, of both decks. So these all, all accumulate up to 82.20 as the, the bid. So um, I did have him at that time also look at a lot of other things. So I'm kind of prepared for future things. And I'm actually working with the county on some other things uh, uh, for repairs there. So we also have some of those things coming up uh, with them. But. Uh, so that's what we have. So do I have any questions on what we're doing? And No? Okay. A lot to do. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry it took us so long, but, you know, he was behind, and, and I know they're all kind of backed up. I was fortunate to get him going so soon. So, yeah. So, okay. Well, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Next, we have Laheim of Galt, 2018-2019 Community, Community Benefit Funding Grant Report to the City Council. Evening Mayor Lamson, Vice Mayor Farmer, Council Members, Staff and Audience. My name is Gail Weber and I've been the Board President of Laheim since January of 2018. During my tenure with Laheim, I have come to really appreciate the work they do in our community, quiet little projects that make such an impact. In April 2018, Laheim brought a pillowcase project to the City Council requesting funds for the community grant. We were awarded $3,500. Thank you very much. Our project was brought to us by T.J. Gadotti from the, the Galt Police Department community resource officer. We had asked TJ to help us find a need and we talked about some of the things we made and it was decided to ask for funds to make 600 plus pillowcases for the CSD and Galt PD community toy drive. We would hand make pillowcases using novelty fabrics, theme fabrics, boy, boy and girl themed and generic. The women of Laheim actually started sewing pillowcases with donated fabric and materials we had before we received the grant. They were determined to do this project with or without grant money. We would figure it out as we went. We received help from the following people. Sheila Stepp, Carolyn M., Mary V., Gail, Odell, Julia, Peggy, Sharon, Linda, Kitty, Sandy, Judy, Colleen, Yasara, Alice, Susan, Linda, Eddie, Betty, Marie, Venus, Colleen Walton and the seniors at New Hope Village, and Mark Cruz and Troop 1119. We made up pillowcases that several volunteers would stop by and exchange their completed pillowcases for kits to make more. It truly became a community project. The pillowcases were made using the burrito method. You would actually sew all the fabric together using one seam into a tube, turn it inside out. That left all the seams on the inside and only one seam to finish. We obviously gave instructions in the pillowcase kits. I myself never quite mastered it, but I was not hired for my sewing skills. <laughs> I could not master it at all. Our deadline was December, but we fulfilled the order around October. For this project, we purchased 635 yards of fabric. 50 plus spools of thread, several needles for sewing machines, two cutting mats as we wore out two of them, several rotary cutting wheels, again we wore out several of them, and a couple of pair of new scissors. These combined with materials we already had on hand allowed us to accomplish this project. The women are already sewing more pillowcases. They go to needy families at Fairside School and homeless teens at both high schools. We were informed that there are 238 homeless teens identified between the two high schools and we are putting together 100 hygiene kits, tote bags, and of course, pillowcases. One of the women makes pillowcases to take to the Sacramento Children's Receiving Home. Laheim's pillowcases have traveled all over Sacramento County. The women of Laheim, thank you for granting us the monies to continue our outreach to those in need in our community. Thank you. Any questions? We actually donated, I think, 690 pillowcases wow. to the thank fire you. department and police department. That's a lot of fabric. So when you say homeless teens, you don't mean people, teens are out on the street, you mean? Both. There are teens that are couch hopping. There are teens that are camping in people's backyard. There are teens under the bridge. Um, but the school told us there was 238 identified between the two high schools. So the high schools have asked us to provide them with 50 hygiene kits and tote bags, 
we give them blankets, socks, a bunch of stuff that then the school can then identify and hand them out to the kids so that their peers aren't aware that they're homeless. So, um, and we'll make more as they need them. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have another presentation, use of consultants. Michael Selling, Public Works Director. Thank you, Mary Lampson uh, and council members. Uh, let's see here. So, Now it's on. Okay. Apologize for the delay. Uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to uh, make this presentation to you tonight. Uh, this is in response. I think there were a few questions from council members, uh, um, you know, not terribly long ago, and, and our interim city manager, Mr. Hagelin, thought it might be a good idea to make a presentation on, on the use of consultants by the city. So um, with that, uh, I want to note that uh, Mr. Arias and, and Ms. Tyson uh, were helpful in putting this together. Uh, it primarily, uh, you know, focuses on our three departments, but it's really generally, uh, you know, applicable to any of the city departments. So, okay. So, in this presentation, I'll cover three key aspects from the city's perspective when it comes to utilizing consultants: uh, the general reasons why and when we use consultants, uh, what the benefits are. And then also what the drawbacks uh, may be. Uh, as we all know, there's trade-offs to everything. So why and when do we use consultants? These are some of the general reasons uh, the local agencies employ consultants. Plain and simple, in many cases, consultants are utilized due to a lack of expertise within an agency. And that's particularly you know, applicable, I think, for a smaller agency like Galt, where you don't have a lot of staff to have a lot of expertise uh, in that staff. Next, as many consultants typically have specific areas of expertise and work with multiple clients for issues in those areas, that experience can be invaluable to the agency to help avoid potential pitfalls and the associated potential lost time and additional costs. Third, while an agency may have an idea on how to address an issue or approach a project, a consultant can provide a second opinion uh, that may or may not confirm the agency's uh, viewpoint on it. They may be able to provide additional uh, innovative options as well and identify challenges the agency may have missed. Relative to staffing, uh, while agency staff may possess the skills to complete a project or address an issue, it may be overly demanding and not the most efficient use of staff resources. So utilizing a consultant can give an agency the, the option to best utilize its staff. And then lastly, some financial requirements legally mandate the use of consultants for reviews and audits, effectively an independent third-party analysis. Also, some grant and funding opportunities have pre-screened pre or qualified pools of consultants that must be used. So turning to the benefits. Consultants can provide additional capability to an agency on an as-needed or temporary basis, what we refer to as staff augmentation. This is typically done to keep the workflow moving until new staff are hired and are trained or to complete one-off projects or efforts. Utilizing them often minimizes the disruption, disruption to the normal workflow versus reprioritizing efforts of agency staff. Making use of consultants avoids ongoing staff costs, you know, things like hiring, training, office space and equipment, uh, salaries, benefits, retirement, etc. And then as consultants are used, to getting up to, are used to getting up to speed quickly, they can save time, which equals money as well. And then lastly, consultants provide external objectivity as well as potential similar prior experience, which can help a local agency weigh in all, all alternatives and help facilitate decision making. With regard to the disadvantages, the process to select and enter a contract can take from a couple to several months and this also requires some staff time that can be spent doing other efforts. A consultant may not be familiar with the pertinent history or other key aspects relative to a project or work effort, or unfamiliar with the processes and workflow of a given agency. Third, while not always the case, utilizing a consultant can add some cost as a consultant still must be managed by staff. Next, while rare, a consultant's availability may be limited due to other contract commitments. And then lastly, another drawback, at times, some consultants may try to use a previously successful approach 
but fail to meet the specific needs of the agency. This can lead to additional time and costs to rectify. So we wanted to turn, uh, now turn to providing some examples, and obviously for public works, uh, some specific, specific examples uh, include that we use them typically on larger or specialized transportation projects. Uh, we use them a lot for wet utilities, as I think you've seen on the agenda tonight. Uh, for the buildings uh, that we maintain, whether it's a new design or a major remodel. And then lastly, uh, for fee and cost of service studies, and that's relative primarily to our wet utilities. Did you want to? Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and talk about community development. Hi, Chris Arias, community development director. Uh, we do use uh, consultants frequently. Our two largest uh, uses of consultants include supplemental building and supplemental planning services. We use four leaf building services for building permit plan review, inspection services, and building official administration. Uh, the cost of the plan review and inspection services are typically recouped through fees charged for the service. Sometimes we do use uh, contract inspectors in lieu of a city employee. Uh, this is usually to fill gaps in staffing. Uh, for example, we are currently using a part-time four-leaf uh, building official in place of our full-time employee who left for another job, I think, back in December of last year. The cost of the part-time contractor is much less than a full-time city employee. We use rainy planning and management for supplemental planning services. The supplemental planning services include development project uh, management and review, and preparing all development-related California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, documents. We use the services for development project management to help balance the workload with staff, and it provides the city a higher level planning service uh, for more advanced planning projects. The consultant expertise is uh, definitely needed for CEQA preparation. CEQA is a highly specialized field and is time consuming. The use of the consultant for CEQA preparation and planning services is definitely efficient for the city. Development in the city is not always consistent, so using the consultant uh, for development services allows us to ebb and flow with the development cycle rather than taking on a long-term obligation for additional staff. In addition, and the best part really, is the direct cost for CEQA preparation and supplemental planning services is paid directly by the developer. No city funds are used for planning-related consultant services. It should be noted that both Four Leaf and Rainey are under contract with the city, and they obtain those contracts through a competitive bidding process. Uh, sometimes we do use consultants for specialized projects. Uh, we're currently using Rainy Planning and Management for uh, the preparation of the Climate Action Plan, and we're using GHD, formerly Omni Means, for the Carillion Boulevard Master Plan. Those special studies are often funded by grants, and if they're not, we would come to the council for approval for uh, paying for those services, and of course there would need to be uh, um, available budget to actually accomplish the task. So we do use consultants in other smaller projects. For example, uh, we have an outside consultant do development project landscape review, but again, development pays for it. There's no direct cost for the city. And in that case in particular, we're way too small to hire a full-time landscape uh, architect to review plans. So uh, we, we, we do need to use that service. So I think that gives you kind of a snapshot of how uh, we use consultants in community development. And I think um, Ms. Tyson is next with, or I don't know if you're speaking or not sure. All right. Thank you, Claire Tyson, finance director. So uh, some examples uh, in finance are audits. And there's a variety of different audits. Um, uh, the, the large audit for the CAFR is, is required. That's basically LSL is a consultant for us. Um, we have state reporting requirements. We have debt eligibility and compliance um, to obtain grant funding. All of those require certain kinds of audits. Um, uh, financial advisors, we're required to have a municipal advisor for registered bonds, and it's an SEC requirement. So we have a consultant that provides that uh, financial advisor um, um, service. Software, um, obviously, we have to have several different kinds of software um, consultants. Um, we will use them 
primarily for uh, um, implementation solutions for um, other financial systems or any other system we have. Um, implementation of a software or upgrade, we're bringing in consultants for all of that. They're experts in that field and know the software better than we do. And frequently those consultants are also doing training for the people using the software. Uh, let's see, uh, special tax consultants. We currently utilize at least one special tax consultant um, for sales tax. Um, it can, those kinds of consultants can be used for property tax or other kinds of taxes. They have uh, knowledge uh, statewide, which we wouldn't have in-house. Um, they also do certain kinds of solution services like um, basically audits of businesses. Are they, are they recording their taxes correctly? So they provide those services for us. And then um, augmentation of staff. We're, as, as a lot of the departments, we're pretty lean on staff, and so we bring in interns. Um, we can bring in accountants, anything to fill the gap. Um, these are usually, well, always less expensive than full-time staff, and um, sometimes the existing staff don't have all the expertise necessary for a particular project. And so bringing in a, accountants from a specialized firm is, is very helpful. Um, any questions for me? Thank you very much. We appreciate you guys addressing this. We, we hear a lot of people concerned with um, use of consultants, and it's good to know that you can save money because you don't have to pay benefits and all that. So, council? Thank you. you I like. Think, uh, Go ahead. The only thing I can make a comment on is the project. Uh, that, that thing is uh, sometimes, sometimes you don't have, have a staff of, uh, to expert on the subject matter. But we need to we hire the consultant, but that's not me. We need to hire the consultant all the time. We need to make every effort in turn to want to make sure all the matter is solved. But if it's not this is necessary to go outside for the consultant. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to kind of piggyback on what Paul said. You know, consultants is one of those things that and I myself, you know, before I was in public office, you know, you always think, you know, why do we need that? And so, I, you know, I've been on both sides of it, and and you know, I look through this stuff pretty thoroughly, and and I listen to what you guys are saying, and I and I I do see that there's very useful, specific things. I know Public Works has many projects that are very specific, um, where we have to be in compliance with, say, like the wastewater treatment plant. I know with Claire, um, your department, where you have to be in compliance with the audit, so forth, and same thing with Chris. So there, in, in every in every department, there's a certain there's a certain specific need. And I get that, and I know sometimes it can be less um, costly to than having a staff member and, and pay employees. Um, a lot of people, the public will say, well, why do we, why do we pay you know, well-paid staff if we're gonna always go out for the expertise? Like, aren't these people that we hire knowledgeable? And um, so that was a question that Tom and I had this discussion today for quite a while, or yesterday actually. And uh, you know, he kind of gave me his, this, uh, Two cents on that, and and you know a lot of it made sense. Um, I I do agree with with Paul though that you know we're in a budget crisis right now, so I think moving forward, um, we just need to be very cognizant of every situation. We need I know each each situation is different that we look at a consultant for X Y Z. We need to look at each one and say, do we really really need this right now? Because I what I don't want is I just want to make sure that our staff doesn't become, you know, using consultants as like a crutch, where we always just become so dependent on them and we feel like if we go to council, the council's always, if we, you know, make a strong enough recommendation, council's gonna give us that consultant. So not to say that you're, you know, staff's trying to be lazy or anything, but I, I tend to, if they tend to feel that that's always gonna be the case, they'll tend to ask more and more. As you know, I've asked for uh, warrants on many consultants today and from all three of you actually on how much we've paid certain consultants, and just to kind of get an understanding of, of that. And I actually asked Tom about this, and I and I would like to let the council know that I've actually um, am going to be asking uh, Claire um, and give her some adequate time to do this. But I would actually like to see, you know, some general numbers of consulting prior to the even the previous city manager's administration. Like how much did Galt typically spend on consultants per year before our previous city manager? So I can look at it as it flowed through several administrations. 
and see kind of where we're at compared to that, compared to our budget, because I think it's going to be important information to look at when we start diving into the budget and figure out where we're at with stuff, because there's going to be hard decisions made, and I just want to kind of get an understanding of what, what do we spend on stuff like that and, and everything. But I, I do understand the use of it, and so um, I know we rely heavily on recommendations from you guys in our reports, but I feel as you know, representative of the public, I have to really ask hard questions about what is this consultant really going to do for us and why do we really need them. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Donna, would you please read the public comment? Mm -hmm. Under Government Code Section 54954.3, members of the public may address the City Council on non-agenda items. The public comment section is for the City Council to receive comments, except for brief responses to questions. No discussion or action may be taken on any item that is not listed on the agenda. Please limit comments to a maximum of five minutes. Speaker cards are located on the table inside the entrances to the council chambers. Once completed, forward the speaker card to the clerk. Those persons wishing to speak on any item scheduled on the agenda will be given an opportunity to do so at the time the item is being considered. Thank you. So I do have some public, and then um, Mr. Skinner, I'm going to wait until yours comes up on the agenda. Okay. So first up is Mike Guttridge. Then second would be Bonnie Rodriguez. <coughs> And then Jennifer Stiegel, Mayor, and Jean Davenport after that. Well, it's a long time since I haven't been in front of the council, but I think it's important why we're out in front of the council tonight. As you know, I'm one of the owners of the uh, Galt Shopping Center up at Twin Cities Road. And uh, I was uh, on vacation. I came back and I got a little note I got a note from our people in Sacramento saying, did you know what your garbage rate's going to be? And I said, no, why? What's it going, a couple thousand bucks? Do you know what our rate went up? Anybody got an idea what our rate went up? It went up from 18,000 to 104,000. $104,000, folks. Now, who in the hell is going to pay $104,000? I've got people right now that could take and pick that garbage up and do the same thing for a hell of a lot less. Because I've contacted them. And they're in the business, and so on and so forth. So I don't know who made the, who made the decision to go with this contract, but somebody failed. I've been in this town a long time. We've built a lot of product. We've built a shopping center and other things. And, and for this to happen to today in Galt is a disaster. Now, I don't know how long it's going to take to get this thing resolved, but I'm going to tell you one thing. There's enough people and enough big shopping centers that in the city of Galt, they will have a lawsuit. And, that, um, that, that, and that's not a scare tactic. That's not anything. I'm saying I can't pay $104,000. That's just foolishness. And I think, you know, this has been going on a while. I have a good friend in the county of Sacramento. He's been working on it for two years. So how come all of a sudden Galt just got on it here in the last, I don't know, what, six months, eight months, a year? It's been out there for a long time, he said. And they've been the, the county of Sacramento has been working on it because he's part of it. So I think the, the city ought to get really get busy getting this result because it's not, it's not going to get, I'm going to tell you, it could get nasty quick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guthridge. Next up, Bonnie Rodriguez representing the Galt Chamber. Good evening, council members. Um, I'm actually here on behalf of one of our chamber members who was unable to be here, so I'm going to read a letter um, that she wanted read in onto record. And I also have pictures, and I'll pass. Actually, I'll just go ahead and pass so you can look at them as I'm reading. Um, this uh, this is from Mary Berry. She's the owner of Central Valley Physical Therapy. She says my business is located on the in the Safe Mart Shopping Plaza next to Ace Hardware. We have been in business in Galt for 17 years. 
Over the last year, we have experienced an increase in people who are not associated with our plaza bringing their personal and business trash to our dumpster, and that's what the pictures are of, um, which has led to our dumpster overflowing with trash. On one occasion, I encountered a man with a U-Haul truck full of trash actively dumping his trash into our dumpster. I sent him away after he told me his boss had instructed him to bring the truck full of trash to our plaza, to our dumpster, and dump it. His business is not in our plaza. We have homeless people who pull trash out of the dumpster, go through it, and leave it on the ground strewn across the plaza. On several occasions, we have seen, on security camera footage, large garbage bags of marijuana plants, soil, insecticide canisters being dumped in our dumpster in the middle of the night. We can then see other individuals pull that trash out, search through it, and leave it outside the dumpster, creating a large mess. Products including hypodermic needles, used condoms, used latex gloves, human feces have all started to show up in the area around our dumpster. Thanks to Mayor Lampson, we secured a padlock for us from Dave Vacareza at Cal Waste. We have been able to keep the trash out of businesses who share the dumpster in, in the dumpster. However, in the last two weeks since we started using the padlock, the people who, have, who were cornering to the plaza to dump their trash hasn't changed. They just deposit their waste around the dumpster instead of in the dumpster, again creating a large mess. As our community moves forward with these astronomical increases in place, my concern is that we will see more people dumping their trash in and around dumpsters of businesses not their own. At the end of the cul-de-sacs, in public trash bins, on the side of the road, leading to more overflowing and progressively unsanitary conditions for the residents of Galt. The property manager shared the old Cal Waste bill with the new Cal Waste and the new Cal Waste bill with us, which shows a price increase of more than 627%. In line with what you have heard from other businesses addressing council, I have not been visited or contacted by anyone from Cal Waste. I urge you to examine the contract the city has signed with Cal Waste to find a way to get out of it. There must be another way to meet the demands of the changes in, re in regulations without putting the cost squarely on the backs of the business owners doing business in Galt. Thank you. So that's Mary's, and I just want to piggyback really quick on that because we personally at the Galt Her Herald and the Chamber have had the, dump the same dumpster issue. We got a padlock, and they're pretty smart, and they come and pull out the back pin, flip it over the other way, and dump stuff in it. Um, it's just going to get worse as people don't want to have to pay for their own trash. So something needs to be done immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Tom, City Manager, is there... Can we get together with the shopping center and kind of work with them a little bit on this? I, I, I don't think it's legal to dunk, dump your trash in, on the ground. No, it, essentially what that is is a, uh, a matter of, um, uh, I, I guess, two things. One, it's a theft of services from others. And so it's a uh, whoever's dumping is stealing the services of whoever is currently paying uh, for that trash service. And so that's not legal. Uh, the, the, the second thing is that uh, we, we, our waste uh, ordinance or our solid waste ordinance has a provision in it that prohibits uh, uh, tampering with the, the solid waste of other folks uh, as well as recycling and, and other things. And so uh, we, we can try to look at it from that perspective and uh, and see what we can do. But ultimately, what, what, what we need, it, to the extent that it becomes a, a law enforcement theft issue, <coughs> or a theft issue that, that law enforcement would look at, is we, we need the particulars, we need to be able to try to find out who it is and, 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 and who's dumping, and that might be the, uh, the, the matters that we would try to coordinate with folks at the, at, at the center. Okay, thank you. All right, next up. Is Jennifer, is it Stiegel, Stiegelmeyer? Okay, with Kids Come First. How are you? Um, my name's Jennifer. We have this small business, the preschool, over in the complex off Twin Cities, and our garbage bill skyrocketed from $181 to over $650. Um, 
we can't afford that as a, you know, our business depends on people who work and if we have to keep passing that cost on to those people, they're gonna go elsewhere to find childcare that's not gonna cost them that much. Hence, our business is gonna be going under. Um, and we just wanna know what the city is planning on doing or if there's anything that we can do besides having to pay these astronomical rates to help keep these small businesses here in Galt. Um, and not close down because I see a lot of them and I spoke to a lot of other business owners who have the same issues and it's really sad. Thank you. And next we have Jean Davenport with various subjects. Various. Everybody, I'm Gene Davenport. I live in the city of Galt, and I want to continue my discussion on the on the garbage rates. And it was a nice presentation on, on the consultants and whatnot. Um, I don't think we've used as many consultants um, since I, Ted Anderson was the last city manager that did a lot of the work in house, and he had people in place that did it. When Jason Berman took over, I think things changed and the ideology changed, and so that's where we're at. Um, you know, at the last meeting, when we were talking about hiring R3 to, to become the consultant to look into the issues of, of the waste contract that we got, no offense, Mr. Hoglin, but the, the, the fact that you said that making sure that cow waste and the city were in compliance with new state regulations, shouldn't that have been done the first time around? I mean, to, to, to revisit that, it should have been handled when you, when you had the contract with the consultant originally. And then to say to blame R3 is to assume information not in evidence. So why weren't things, I mean, I don't understand that. It's kind of like to assume information not in evidence. I mean, information should have been given to us. We should have been able to deal with it publicly. It wasn't because how many times were entities or people asked about the rate and were not given an answer? I mean, publicly, I know the city manager was asked once, and he didn't answer at all. And uh, when Dave Acarezza was approached about it, he didn't give an answer. So, you know, you can't assume anything if you don't have the information. So that, that statement kind of like falls on deaf ears as far as I'm concerned, because the bottom line is all the people that are going to continue to come to these meetings and they're going to talk to you about their garbage rates, which is totally unfair. I don't care what the law says, I don't care what it is, you should get the city attorney to write Sacramento and say this is not something that we can s sustain. What are we gonna do? And then if we have to file suit against the state, we need to do, to do that rather than them suing you guys. Because it, it just doesn't make sense for this to go forward in this fashion. Um, there's so many things that are wrong with the way this was handled. It's, whether it's R3 or RD2, it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, you guys need to start publicly stating what you want those consultants to do so you, you can answer to the people that come here. And we don't publicly hear from you guys. You guys, we can't talk about it publicly. That's what the issue is for us, I think a lot of us anyway. You guys aren't clarifying what we're getting into. And then you guys get behind the wall because you can't talk about it, your hands get tied. That's not right. It's not right at all. So you should publicly say, all right, you want to hire this consultant, next week we're going to give you direction from the dais about what you, we want you guys to do. And I think that's fair. At least we'll know where you guys are going and what's going to succeed and what's going to fail, fail and we can go forward with that. That being said, when Mark brought up at the last meeting too about the, um, about the big sign that was going to go up on the highway, Regardless if you like it or not, whether you're in favor of billboards or not, really you shouldn't ha have any weight on this. If you were asking for $4,500 when you're giving $50,000 for all these consultants to do something that's going to bring in over $100,000 a year initially. It's probably going to go up. It's, you know, I think it's, it's smart to look at this realistically. You say you're, you know, there were over a million dollar deficit that if the city's facing. You got $100,000, you know, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not rocket scientists, whether you like something or not. Sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and say, okay, let's do this. And that being said, that along those lines, if you got a deficit, and you want to take care of it right now, and you want to be able to breathe, whether you like this or not, 
think about open a dispensary in this city and get with the chief and see how it can be viable. Because to get a dispensary in this city, I think it would knock out all the red, all the red ink that we have. I mean, honestly, and I don't know how the chief personally feels about it, but I just think it's something we need to consider because it's legal today. It's not, you can't go, you can go to Stockton and buy it, you can go to Lodi and buy it, you can go to Sacramento and buy it. Why don't we get that tax dollar and keep it home? So appreciate your time, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Davenport. <clears throat> All right, reports by city council members on regional boards, commissions, and committees. Vice Mayor Farmer? Nothing. Nothing to report on. Okay. Andy? Council Member Campion? No council Member Lozano? Uh, Nothing to report other than uh, policy and innovation, or SACOG policy and innovation committee is meeting on next Monday. So I'll have something to report after that. All right, and I don't either, thank you. All right, information consent calendar. Can I get a motion to receive and file warrants for periods ending May 22nd, 2019. Request for appropriation for increased usage of household hazardous waste services. I have four things, correct? Correct. Okay. Can I get a motion? <coughs> Moved by Councilmember Campion. Second. Second. Second by Councilmember Lozano. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Farmer. Aye. Councilmember Sandu. Aye. Councilmember Campion. Aye. Councilmember Lozano. Aye. Mayor Lamson. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Now we have pulled some things for discussion. The first item is the award of contract for consultant services for wastewater treatment plant optimization. Councilman Farber? Yeah, I just had a two, few questions for you, um, Mike, and I apologize I didn't get these to you in advance, but I had a ton of things I was trying to look through on the agenda and research. So um, first of all, so if I'm understanding this correctly, our plant was reclassified from class three to class four which comes along with some, some additional requirements and testing, um, which our staff, our wastewater staff is not knowledgeable on what to do. So you wanna bring in Mr. Cordovis, yeah. um, who's a, uh, someone we've used in the past. Um, I did do some research, it looks like we used him three times last year, I saw. So um, to train our new supervisor that was promoted. Correct. And <coughs> to, to be, to run the test to be compliant, all that, right? Correct. So my question was, there was a reference to that we were down to staff members. Um, okay. I didn't really understand what that was relevant to this, meaning like, um, if we're training the supervisor, but should, why do we not wait till we have those two positions filled and then train everybody at one time? Yeah, it's kind of contextual. What I understand from staff and, and Mr. Clarkson may be here to provide some additional information, but probably at least the last five years or so, I think what's kind of been our situation is, is We've, we've tried to bring folks in and it's such a competitive environment that they get trained up and go somewhere else kind of thing and we weren't that competitive, I, I understand, uh, whether it's you know on, on compensation and whatnot, benefits. Uh, and, and through the most recent MOU, we feel now that we're much more competitive, but it still does take a couple years to get somebody in, kind of train them up. So we've been kind of growing our own. And with that, we've just uh, um, you know been able to promote uh, an internal candidate uh, to the plant supervisor. So bringing Mr. Cordenovis in, who's very well versed in these matters, he can train our new plant uh, supervisor. And also as we gain, you know, fill these, these last couple of positions and hopefully, you know, like I say, keep growing our own kind of thing, we can retain them. Uh, that that he can then pass that information down. So we don't really have the time uh, luxury to wait until we fill those positions because that uh, that uh, requirement, uh, there is a time constraint on that zinc time schedule order. So for I think later this summer, uh, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add, but that's really kind of what's driving it, why we need to get Mr. Cordenova. So which leads me to my next question where it said that there was time sensitive because these studies were due by summer. Well, it's summer. I was just curious if, um, you know, was this something that snuck up on us? Because if we were, if we were up, if our, if our plant was reclassified, I mean, when did that take place? I believe, is that the 2016 or was that more recent? I'll, I'll defer to Mr. Clarkson. Mayor, Council, um, Clarkson, City Engineer. 
Yeah, it, we were uh, upgraded in December of 2017. It took us time to get through the budget process, to get through uh, approvals and everything and what was needed by the state. And we, we saw that the positions that we had, the grades, the grade certification level went up that we have to have at the plant. Okay. And so we went into training, we've done all this. As far as you're saying, caught off guard, we had an employee that retired. I don't know, is this thing on? Mm -hmm. I'll go loud. We can hear you. Um, we had an employee that retired in December. We went out and we recruited. Good job, that was done. We, were, we thought that we would fill it from the outside, but it ended, ended up that uh, one of our employees was very competitive. So that, that didn't change our numbers any. We were still down, we're down three operators right now. And so there's a lot of people doing, you know, overtime work. Um, this, this position for the Dan Cordnovis that we have for the consultant, it's only about six hours a week. I'm there about 12 to 15 hours a week helping training, helping doing things that are out there. This is, this is what's happened for several years. It's been ongoing, except losing the plant manager. We had him for five years, but um, um, that was just done in December. So you can't anticipate when the next person's gonna go. And it is not a really quick, we bring somebody on in a week, they can do stuff. It takes over a year and a half to get the first certification. And now our plant requires the third grade, which is four to six years to get that. It's a long process. Okay, and we, I, we've been fighting all along with this. I just asked because it just said the reason we weren't going out to RFP, and I get that we, if we've had this, um, this particular person, obviously he's done some work for us, um, that we have this relationship. But I always just make sure when we are not going out to bid for something, and we, you're asking for up to fifty thousand dollars. I mean, I'm hoping it doesn't go up that high, but you know, so I just, you know, just to hand somebody fifty grand. Even with the previous right. relationship, I just want to make sure. And it talks about time constraint. You know, we didn't have time to bid because I'm just wondering why didn't we have time? Did this, did this come out of nowhere? Did we just, you know, fall? You know, I, that's what I'm trying to get at is how that happened. I would like to add to that. When our um, supervisor indicated that he was going to retire, we've we kept asking him to stay, and he would stay for another six months. And then he said, "Okay, I'll do it another six months." So this went on for a period of time. He wasn't really giving us a, a, a detail, but when he did last November. Um, in 218, I went out and I contacted probably well over 10 agencies to see if I could have a grade a four at the plant, if I can get some consulting. This was just for having a certified operator come in and do part-time work for us. Nobody had anything and I looked for quite a while. And so I started doing the duties myself back in January, which I'll continue doing the duties of the chief plant operator um, on this. Uh, probably for the next year or so. And uh, so we really looked hard. I looked hard to find somebody because I didn't have the time to spare, you know, for this. But I have to do it because there's nobody else out there. So I'm assuming that we train the supervisor and then if we, when we fill the operator one and two positions, then, then that supervisor can then in train internally or is this going to be an ongoing thing we have to have Mr. Mr. Dan come back and do for us? We're, we're hoping that this, that this will... If we can keep the people we have, we have two that will probably become grade threes within the next year. Um, we fill it with, we, we really can't tell if we're gonna fill with certified operators or not, or OITs, that means they're not certified and that we have to work through. So we're just hoping that within this next year, we'll have enough certified operators, we'll have enough people staying here that we're not gonna need additional assistance. And the funding for this, this goes with my next J4. I'm kind of trying to mingle the two questions together. The funding for this comes from the 07. Yeah, wastewater enterprise plan, fund, wastewater enterprise. Which fund. comes from the rate payers. The, the rates. On their their yeah. annual. Their, Is this budgeted their, money from that your right. department's budget or it comes yes. from? Okay. All right. You can just move on to J4. He might have to answer something on this one. Well, I think don't we have to vote on this one? Oh, first, sorry. Please? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, can I get a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a contract with Dan Cortovinas for an optimization services at the wastewater treatment plant in the supplemental amount of up to $49,920. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Okay, motion made by Councilmember Campion, seconded by Councilmember Lozano. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Farmer? Aye. Councilmember Sandu? Here. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Lozano? Aye. 
Mayor Lamson. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Next subject award of contracts for the supervisory control and data acquisition software upgrade. So my questions on this were just, just does this have to do with some of the things we voted on earlier in the year to, imp to, to put in the safety net, I guess I would consider it, you know, that we started, there was some new protocols and things we started putting in place. This seems like it was kind of some of that. Is this more of that? There was, yeah, there were some sensors that we were basically purchased to put into the lift stations to monitor those. And the data that those sensors send out, it goes to the uh, supervisory control uh, data acquisition system. So this is basically to upgrade our system, which is, as I understand it, three, three going on four years old? Yeah, we purchased it five years ago. Five years, okay. And it took a year to get installed because we were constructing. But I'll add a, a couple of things. This, the SCADA system is separate th than what was voted on or, or what we approved several months back. There's two separate systems. This is, a, this is the system that we have used for the last five years at the plant um, to collect all of our data and all of the instrumentation. The, the company no longer is going to, they've put us off for two years. They've kept supplying us technical support the last two years, but it's an old, uh, it's an old model and they, they're just not gonna help us anymore with it because they're, they're, they want us to go to upgrade or go to somebody else. Right, or yeah, I yeah, I understand software and upgrades and all that. So basically this is, this is just to, we have to upgrade the software in order to get the support, the continued support that comes along with it. And, 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 so and the timing was, was just coincidental. There was a two year, so two, year, two years we have to renew that support again. It looks like it was a two year Correct. stretch. Yeah. Correct. Okay, um, I think that's all I had. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Any other discussion? Can I get a motion to adopt a resolution number one, authorizing the city manager to execute a contract with F&M Electric and Machinery Incorporated doing business as Wonderware California to provide the software license and support for the city supervisory control and data acquisition system for in the amount of, or for the amount of $44,700 and two, authorizing the city manager to execute a professional services contract with John Wooten integration integration to ensure integration of the new software for the amount of six thousand two hundred fifty dollars do i have a motion so moved second okay motion made by vice mayor farmer seconded by council member campion roll call vote please vice mayor farmer aye council member sandu aye council member campion aye council member lozano aye mayor lamson aye motion passes five zero all right, schedule matters. Public hearing. Do I open it? Open it? No, it's not going to be for presentation today. So okay. It's not open. All right, Ms. Tyson. Master fee schedule update. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, tonight we are bringing forth to you um, the midterm budget. Uh, this is the public hearing evening. We're going to look at the fees, the capital projects, and um, budget adjustments for fiscal year 1819 and 1920. Um, the midterm budget project is a collaborative effort um, of the interim city manager, the department directors, and the finance staff. Um, we've spent several months evaluating and analyzing the data, and the results are being presented to you tonight. The adopted budgets are for a two-year cycle here at the City of Galt. Um, that approval was done in June of 2018. This evening we are presenting the Master Fee Schedule Update, um, Capital Improvement Program, and budget amendments for the two fiscal years. Master Fee Schedule Update, um, fees are implemented to cover the cost of public service that are requested by businesses and residents. These fees include those services that protect, exclude, excuse me, those services that protect health, safety, and welfare of the general public. So the City of Galt um, Master Fee Schedule complies with Prop 26, which prohibits government agencies from charging more for a service than the reasonable cost of providing that service. The proposed fee schedule provides each fee from the prior fiscal year, 1819, and the new fiscal year 1920 
with references to information used to determine the proposed rates. Most fee increases are based on CPI. Um, some fees are limited by market rates, primarily in the parks and recs um, fees. Many of the city fees are below cost. Um, uh, many of the fees listed in this master fee schedule are, have already been approved by council or other authority, um, but are listed here to provide a comprehensive report. Um, examples of those previously approved items are Measure A fees, which are in this document, are set by the county. The refuse rates that we've talked about are by contract and impact fees have been set by prior council resolution. So with that, if there are no other, no other questions, I think all three of these items are presented to you separately. There is a recommendation, K-1, for the master fee schedule update. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna open the public hearing receive comments and do you want council comments first or public all right I have a master fee schedule increase in parks and rec by Craig Skinner he's representing youth youth sports hello how are you folks doing tonight um, don't mind me I'm sorry a little nervous never done this before um, have some parents here with us tonight um, representing not everyone of course can make it um, just a couple questions um, before you guys looking into doing this increasing the fees on on the kids which is actually probably the easiest target I hate to say it um, just a couple questions has the council studied the Parks and Rec's budget um, such as the staff the wages job descriptions and the overall profit the flea market is making because that was here to pay for Parks and Rec I'm not sure all the money's going there. Pretty sure it's not. Don't know if any of you folks have ever been to any of the public you know, events for youth sports. If you have, I'm sure you've seen the fields falling apart. Infrastructure is horrible. Um, not investing back in what we have. Fields don't work as far as the scoreboards, holes and tarps, getting stuff in plastic bags as far as T-ball's concerned. They see uh, what well, fees are below cost. We haven't received new equipment it's unsafe, I get helmets from 89 that you want to put on little girls. We talk about concussion issues, we talk about a lot of things. Communication is horrible. Um, you want to increase our fees, this will be I think the second time in two years we're looking at almost a 20% increase here. There is no discount for a multiple family discount. Count, uh, county Youth Soccer, they found a way to make it a little more economical. They give you a break for multi-people in the family. We get new balls for each kid. We get first aid kits with uh, Parks and Rec. We get no first aid training, which is ridiculous. We deal with kids. Some might happen to a kid, some might happen to an umpire. There's no safety precautions at all. Um, as us as coaches, we're volunteer. We don't get paid. I get emails from people. Hey, have you guys contacted us? That's not my job. I don't get paid to take care of Parks and Rec. I volunteer because we have kids. That's what we do. There's no, one to, there's no one to be contact. I've left messages for Monica. I have left a message for Armando, I think his name is, or some of that nature. I don't get calls back, I deal with Monica. Unfortunately, the city employees deal with the blunt of the people at the games. No bosses out there to show their face. They'd rather tuck tail and hide, which is ridiculous. You want to increase crease, but we don't see no improvements for anything for these kids. It's unsafe. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm sorry if I'm getting off topic here because I'm very emotional about this. It makes me upset that we have a Parks and Rec department that should be thriving, that is made for kids. But we're talking about how we don't have no money and we want to increase fees. You're targeting the easiest people, and that's parents who will do anything for their kids. There are ways to, to work around this, and I think you folks can really do some damage, investigate, see where our money's going, because we want to know. We want to know where the money is going every which way, shape, or fashion. Um, you talk about putting up a billboard, I heard, Parks and Rec, is that gonna to go to Parks and Rec? Is that gonna to go to increasing, you know, improving the fields? Is a flea market sustainable? If we haven't made money, then that's bad business. Then we should all be fired for operating bad business. Get rid of it, dissolve it. They, we've lost soccer, Parks and Rec has lost soccer. 
they've lost baseball, you'll lose softball and you will lose basketball as well. So please reconsider and think about that and investigate where our money's going because like I said, unfortunately we don't have enough people here and I wish they were here. They're very upset. Lack of communication, like I said, equipment's ridiculous. The fields are ridiculous. Men's league gets charged less than us. You look around us, you're talking about Elk Grove and everywhere else. Men's league is 450 here, it's 750 everywhere else. We get pushed to the side, each team is $1,200. Each, each individual youth team is $1,200 and we get the short end of the stick. We get pushed to McCaffrey fields, which are ridiculous. If you folks go look at them, there's weeds everywhere. The field is not safe. The fences are falling down. I mean, quite here. I mean, I don't know if any of you folks have ever been to a youth event. I'm sure when your kids were probably young, but probably nothing of current times. So I hope you folks investigate that before you approve any type of pay increase or any type of fee increase. Please investigate this because you guys hurt the youth. We're not going to do anything good for our city. We're not going to be able to build, build camaraderie and show the city of Galt and the kids of Galt that we actually care about them because we are starting to seclude people now. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Is there any more public comment? You, you are able to come up without filling out a card at this time since it is a public hearing. Okay, council, any discussion? I have a couple of questions, um, and if I may. Hold on one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Do I close it before council comments? Um, it, yes, you can close it now. Um, if you'd like to have the benefit of some any additional discussion you foresee, then you can wait to close it later, but it would be appropriate to close the public hearing now. Okay. Public hearing is closed. Sorry, council member Lozano, go for it. Thank you. Um, I do have a couple of questions uh, in regards to the, specifically the youth T-ball softball registration. Um, I noticed in the staff report, and I apologize for not bringing this up before, but it, uh, uh, the gentleman kind of triggered a question for me. Um, under uh, Park and Recreation, we have youth T-ball and softball registration. Uh, it shows that T-ball the recommendation is uh, to be increased by $10. And if you go down um, to the other age groups, um, boys at six years of age is a $5 increase. And then it, there's no increase at all for seven and eight year old girls. And then minis, I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be um, softball. Um, there's a $10 increase, then it goes to $5 for minor. So anyhow, what, what I'm asking, I guess, is there's, there's a variance in increased fees and, and or not um, in this, er, in this uh, part of the report, um, specifically the one that was brought up with the uh, girls softball. Um, how, how do we get to that? So in, in past years, uh, what we did is we had a separate fee for each one of uh, the age groups. So you would have minis, uh, like you saw here last year at 90, 95, and then $100, we would go up by $5 in increments uh, across the board. I've noticed uh, through looking at other uh, groups' fees that there's a standard fee for certain age groups. And so what I did is I started grouping these together. Uh, you'll see that there's not an increase for the, the majors at the 13, 14. Um, and what I did is I've, I've put together a cost sheet for the, the total combined group um, for an overall cost analysis for the whole um, girls age group. There, there's different, I mean, you can go back and do a tiered pricing. This way it's showing an overall cost to the program for the girls softball. Okay, I, I, I guess my, my question is, and, and I'm just trying to wrap my head around around this based on my experience in, in youth sports. Um, although it's a little different um, when I was involved, and it was a nonprofit youth sports organization, and so it wasn't necessarily tied. But um, we had we had a fee for t-ball because t-ball was significantly less um, expensive to equip and run, just based on the nature of of it being t-ball. Um, and then 
it, it was pretty much the same fee for everybody else. And, um, and again, my experience was just running the nonprofit organization uh, to keep umpires playing in uniforms and things like that. Um, and so I, I, I think it's just a little confusing, at least for me, um, to have these different rates. I, I mean, I, I recognize it's either $75 or 100 is what is proposed. Um, but it, it looks like we're, we're making a different adjustment for each group. And, and I appreciate your explanation, Armando, um, but I, I just can't wrap my head around that. It, it kind of goes back to where you were saying that these are all the same programs, the minis, minors, and majors. That's where they're playing softball. They have umpires. They have the same thing. What we did is we, in the previous years, we had placed a tier on it. So you wouldn't go from 75 to 100. You would go from 75 to to 90. And then this year, if we would have kept to this, the, the rates probably would have been 90, 95, and 105. So what we did is we put together, because the the girls' majors teams, we don't have enough to, sub, to fully fund that group. Um, of course, we are losing close to $6,000 if we, if we ran that as an individual group. So I'm trying to put these costs together to make it a little more friendly to not just to show it in a different way. You're still collecting the amount. We're still losing the, the amount of money that we're losing. It's just a different way to show it and a different way to collect uh, fees for it. Okay. Uh, w another question I had real quick is what do the fees go toward? Um, and again, I, I, it was brought up by Mr. Skinner and, 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 and I certainly, uh, back in many years ago when I was involved in the organization, similar, uh, was asked the same question. And we had a breakdown of um, costs that we would have to pay the government agency to use the fields that took care of mowing. And, and then we had a, a, a line item for field maintenance, which is chalk and all of that. But what, do, what do these fees go toward? Well, basically the same things. We have staffing for um, the games, umpires, depending on the age division, scorekeepers, um, uh, to replace equipment, to uh, positive coaching alliance training, um, uniforms, uh, trophies. Um, GSSA requires us to register the teams with them. So I, I have a cost breakdown for every, every um, program we have in here. And do background checks go into that as well? Actually, uh, that is not, uh, there is no cost for volunteers for background. They are fingerprinted, but I, don't, I believe there is, that is at no cost. Is that correct? $13. Okay. It's a $13 cost, but is that cost is not in here then. And that's borne by the volunteer? No. No. By the city. But that's not allocated. So that's, a, that's an expense. It's not listed in here, though. Okay. And, and, and again, excuse me for the, the questions, but the, so for T-ball, the city runs the T-ball program, which is boys and girls, is that correct? Correct. We run uh, boys and girls up until age six, and then uh, girls from seven to 14. Uh, GYB takes over the boys program at age seven. Has, and again, this is just for information, doesn't right. necessarily have to do with the rate. Has there ever been an, uh, a GYB or girls softball? No, I've uh, talked to a couple of different programs. Um, like CSD, they don't offer a softball program for the older girls. You go into right. nonprofits. Uh, Lodi has uh, age groups that range for the 910 from $110 to 115 to the 11, 12s, and 135 for the 13 and 14 year olds. Okay. And we're not collecting any money, any of this money is not going into, uh, that we're collecting is going, my understanding is it's not going into capital improvement. We have no, we're not, not able that, to this save is, any money to. We have our revenues that will offset our <laughs> expenditures to a certain extent, but not fully. Okay. I believe at one time you gave us a whole list of how where the money goes and how everything's pretty much underfunded. Correct. 
the, the city went through a fee study, I want to say about four or five years ago. The spreadsheet was created for us, and what we do is we update it with the, the minimum wage increases, any type of uh, increase to costs or services. Um, so we just make the adjustments on an annual basis to what those are. Can you refresh my memory on what minimum, minimum wage went up to? I apologize. Um, well, over the last three years, it went from 850. I think we're currently at 12, and I think we're getting one more step in 2019. Every year, we're going to get another step okay. until we hit. Yeah, up until $15 an hour. That's that's affecting everybody, I think. And and the majority of our employees are minimum wage employees. Okay. And the, this went in front of the Parks and Rec Commission. Yes, it was uh, approved on. Uh, the February 13th meeting. Okay. Discussion's closed. Um, the hearing's closed. I have a hand. What do I do? No? Well, I have a question. Go ahead. <coughs> Armando, on these, um, as far as the program, uh, based on these fees, is that full cost recovery for the uh, cost of the of operating the no. program? No. I, I determine those by market rate. I, I have a spreadsheet here from looking at our neighbors because in the past council has asked us to look at what elk grove does what lodi does and we are this uh this was done in 2018 and we're still under um, every one of those prices that they approved in 2018. do you have any idea as to what the subsidy is on the behalf of the city for each one of these programs i do and each one of these sheets will provide that information that I have here that I provide the... Oh, so it, for each age group it varies? Yes. Okay, generally speaking, what is our we, percentage? We try and get, so we, we've broken this down into um, hard costs, soft costs, and again, this is direction that we've received in the, from the previous uh, administration where we're accounting for the cost to uh, use the registration program, to uh, taking registrations, those type of costs. Sure. Um, then we add the central service cost to these programs. Uh, the direction was to get us close to our hard cost, um, and we try and do that. In some cases, we're very, very close, and some were far off, okay. depending on the program. So there's no general number? No, I have not been given direction to provide to be within X percentage of the hard cost or overall cost. Okay, thank you. Okay. Vice Mayor Farmer, did you have something? Yeah, but he he's, he spoke, so we have to have our discussion. The, that part's closed, so let's finish ours. <laughs> all right. Well, my comments are about all that Rich and Kurt were asking about. So, Armando, between T-ball, how many game? Roughly how many? I, I coached many <laughs> minors, majors. I've coached all these. I played adult for many. I'm familiar with the the facilities. I'm familiar with how many games. I'm familiar with all that. So you were asking if any of us were. I very much am. So I, I know. I know it from the inside. Um, T-ball and how many games are these teams getting, Armando? Like eight games a season? Between eight and 11, depending on the age group. Um, we'll do an eight-game season um, and then go into playoffs, and then that would determine they could play one game in playoffs or go all the way through the championship, play 11. Um, sometimes when there's uh, 10 teams, we'll do a nine-game regular season just so – Everybody can play each other once, uh, but they'll get a minimum of eight games. So just give me an approximate between T-ball and the next age group, 78-year-olds and minis and minors, roughly in each division, how many teams do you think sign up average? You can give me a conservative number if you want. Um, That's a good question. I can give you what we um, estimate if you'd like. Okay, yeah. So for T-ball, we estimated, this is uh, T-ball boys and girls, uh, we estimated 145 participants. So say 12 players per team. Uh, we try and keep that to 10, okay. between 10 and 12. 14 teams. Yeah, but it, in, that, in that group, some coaches are more desired, so they'll take on more than the what we have, we'll take on 10 to 12, sometimes up to 13 kids. 
um, instructionals, um, you're looking at 36. Instructional seven and eight, looking at 56. Hmm. Girls minis, we are looking at 66. And this is where we would try and do the, the number 12 uh, per team, the minis, minors, and majors. Mm -hmm. Right, so I got that number from you. Um, 56 for the minors and 36 for the majors. Those are 56 players? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 36. Okay, so it range, it's ranging from 14 teams with T-ball up to six teams for some of the higher, right? Well, right. We got 36, yeah. So I mean, just doing some quick math, you got a hundred hundred dollars for majors. You got seventy five for T ball. These are the proposed rates. I mean, we're roughly looking at like fifty thousand dollars to run this program is what we're collecting for. The I can tell you what we estimated for uh, minis, minors, majors is fifteen thousand dollars. Instructional seven eight, we estimated four thousand two hundred. Instructional six two thousand seven hundred. Okay, so you don't have to give me the numbers, but T ball. If you say you got fourteen teams in T ball, you're basically that's twelve thousand just for T ball. Yes. Seventy five dollars a player. Ten, yeah, ten thousand. So I mean, T ball like T ball. They don't use umpires. They don't even use the fields. That we have staff comes out sets a backstop. We give them some gear, which to be honest with you, and and. I mean, you know, Armando, the gear is going to be less than stellar at times. Um, and again, don't take any of this personally. I'm just talking about the program itself because I've been there. I just, what I'm saying and what I'm trying to reverberate from the community, and I've, I've, been, I've been getting inundated with, with, with people coming to me. And, and some of this has, you know, been going on for a long time. Some of it, you know, and, and we all know why. I mean, you know, Parks and Rec, we're like rubbing two nickels together. Um, I know the costs don't seem appropriate, like they don't feel like the money's going to the right places. Um, I, I, have, I, I do struggle with finding out where we spend $900 to run a t-ball program that plays eight games. Um, I, I mean, I know there's staff costs and you have this and that, but I, I mean, what I, want, what I want to remind people is, and I know these costs, these programs don't cover themselves. The, Parks and Rec never covers itself. I mean, we can sit there and try to fight and make it recoup its money, but I mean, the bottom line is these programs are so critical. I remember having players that I knew certain players on my team that I coached, this was the only time they're ever gonna play sports. I just looked at that girl and said, she's never gonna play sports after this time. These are not kids that can afford travel ball or you know, that kind of sport. I mean, they had grandma dropping them off and uncle Johnny picking them up because mom's working two jobs at Carl's Jr. I, that's, I'm not exaggerating, that's an exact scenario. So, I mean, $100 for a family to have their nine-year-old play ball, it, you know, maybe $100 is an odd to some people. To other people, $100 is like an eighth of their paycheck for the month. And this is a rec program. This is trying to get people in the community into a program that they can play sports, maybe for one time in their life. Um, and, and I think <coughs> my overall problem with, with this is, is, yeah, we're in a budget crisis. I, I get that. And we need to find, make some hard decisions. But we're, sit we're sitting here looking for, you know, I mean, to cut expenditures and find money that we need to fix our budget to go after, it's like my wife and I buying a new car and we decide, oh, we have overspent, we can't afford this car, and then going to my daughter and saying, I gotta cut your, your allowance. I mean, why are we going, I feel like we're, we're, we're seriously looking for five and $10. It's such petty stuff here, I think, I don't know. I mean, I know it, it sounds bad, you know, in the middle of a budget, but I, I've just, I've been, I just don't like it. I don't, I don't like it. I'm not gonna vote in favor of raising any of the sports fees. I don't have a problem with the other fees, with the, with the, with the facilities rentals going up. Um, I think they're, those are appropriate. I see some other rates going up, but generally what I'm seeing out of all these rates um, that impact the community directly as far as sports and, and rentals of facilities, the ones I see the most that come to me or that I'm seeing in here are the sports programs. And, and to me, I'm just, I'm not, not okay with it. I, I think, you know, our, our, I think we, need, we have some serious work to do in our, in our Parks and Recreation program, and I, I think everybody that runs the program, including, including uh, our director, Armando, and, and our staff, they're all trying to do their best. You know, we're trying to 
you know, there's positions that we're trying to create to alleviate this, but in a budget crisis, we're not sure if that's going to happen. So we're, we're all trying to find solutions here. But in the time being, I don't think the answer here is to raise fees on the one thing that our community uses the most. So I, I have other stuff to talk about on this, but I think I'm just going to leave it at that right there. Um, Armando, I've been hearing a few things. Um, I know it's, it was kind of a crazy year because of the rains and the games kept getting rained out. So there was a little communication, you know, games getting canceled and, and things like that. And I hate to be, hopefully we can find some other things in here to pick on you for. But, um, Claire, anyway, would it be possible for you maybe to if, if the, have a, um, a coaches meeting just to kind of go over, re review the seasons and kind of review it with them and see if they, they want to they want communication, so maybe they'll actually meet with you so, and talk so about that. We've had a you have, we have a coaches meeting at the beginning of the season. We um, I inform the city manager that uh, as soon as the season ends, and I think today's the last day. If it wasn't last night, that we'll be sending out an email asking for suggestions and okay. comments if they'd like to provide them to us. Um, we've last week uh, we sent out a mass email to all the coaches, informing them, giving them all our email addresses and. Uh, contact information and the progress of where to go through. Um, I we haven't heard from anybody. Uh, Mr. Skinner stated that he left me a voicemail. I'm sorry, I have yet to receive it. I don't know where he left that voicemail. It wasn't on my my voice line. Um, there is another Armando, but maybe it got transferred to his within my department. Um, I know he's met with Monica several times. I know he's spoken to Rami, um, our site supervisor. So. Um, we're, we're here, we're willing to talk. You know, Mr. Vice Mayor Farmer, you said, you know, not to take it personal. It's hard to take a person, not to take it personal. You know, I pride myself in, in the work that I do in this community. My kids have been in these programs. I live in this community and it's hard to not take it personal when I think that I'm trying to do the best that I can with what's provided to me. These are recommendations to you and you guys can provide direction to me and how you want these fees to be. And I'll be glad to enforce that this is what I've been directed to do in the past so I appreciate it. thank you for letting me know about all the communication and things and we hear communication in almost every department that's just something that happens in um, anytime there's an organization school district anywhere there's sometimes the communication doesn't get out or it does and people it skims through it or it goes to junk mail so um, we appreciate you emailing them all. Uh, Amanda just a uh, uh, quick question uh, uh, the fees increase, uh, I believe, uh, due to the minimum wages and some other costs, right? The, ma the majority of the fee increase is going to be to the because of the minimum wage cost. Um, you know, there are costs that are going up with, like, our contract for our umpires for our adult leagues. Um, there's, but a lot of it is just um, the minimum wage. And you're going to start seeing this even go up more once we hit the $15 range because we're, we're compacting into our supervisor rates. We haven't increased any of our, you know, everybody's thinking we're getting this big raise and none of us are. It's the only raises that are really coming are for the minimum wage group. And now they're getting close and Cora can verify this, that they're gonna start bumping those wages up also. Um, my, at one point, my, my coordinators were making three to four dollars more than uh, a lot of the field workers and now it's pretty close, it's really, to me, not worth it to be a supervisor because might as well just be a worker and not worry about any of the issues. Right. So the other thing is is uh, that uh, fees increase is almost 25 percent or 20 percent. It it right. will it will range um, between program. Again, I I'm not just looking at our costs, our programs. I'm looking at market rate around here. There's there's no way that this city is going to allow us to raise rates to one cover costs because we then we wouldn't have a program to run. There, we would nobody would sign up if I had to recover full costs. I look at what Lodi does. I look what uh, CS, CSD does, uh, what they're charging for these programs, and we're again I'm we're still under the 2018 comparison that I did last year for a majority of these programs. Yeah, but my my con uh, you know is, is a comment is is a youth table. You know these are the kids. Uh, you know these uh, these are the kids. They, that's their future is. And 25% uh, fees uh, is, uh, I know there is an increase, it is, it is all the cost of it, but 25% increase uh, is a little bit off uh, from my mind. 
Some of them aren't going up at all. <clears throat> some of them are going up five dollars. Some aren't going up at all. I have one more thing to add, real quick, um, just to shift gears a little bit on something. Um, I had some people ask me, Armando. Um, we've always charged, we've always charged non-resident citizens more on the facility rentals, right? Uh, like the Shibola Center. Yeah. Yes. Like little, yeah. There, there's a non-resident fee. We have very few non-resident fees. Uh, we've taken away a lot of those because, again, we're we're a community. We're a Campo, Thornton, um, right. Herald. Uh, but when it comes to the rental of the Littleton Center, there is a non-resident fee. And then relating that same question with the sports programs, I've been asked, you know, why are we not charging, uh, you know, non-resident fees? I used to know, I remember when we used to charge players, like for the adult league, if you were from Lodi or whatever, they charge more. But people just, I mean, we just found it was counterproductive to people playing and then staff time to keep track of it. And you just said it wasn't, wasn't, it just wasn't reasonable to at, do that. At one time we had three levels of fees. We had the resident fee, the high school boundary fee, and then the non-resident fee, non-high school fee. Uh, it was determined, I want to say about 10 years ago to remove the, the resident, the non-resident fee, because again, we are a community that serves more than just golf. Right. And so, you know, going back with to the minimum wage, we, we get all that. Um, but, you know, like to think about, you know, I played adult league and I remember it's, you know, adult league has been going up and now I think it's going to be 425 or something like that. Four feet, yeah. So anyways, um, you know, but you basically have 10 people, it's $40 a player, or $45 a player now. You have T-ball, it's 900. And I know they're getting shirts and they're getting some gear, but... These parents are dedicating their time. I mean, I don't know if you know, but Mr. Skinner over here has six children. He has six kids and his wife is ill. And so for, the, for, for him to take his time to even be here tonight to say, you know, I'm upset because we're, him and other parents are putting in their time and, and they're, they're, you know, fighting up here for, for you know, five or ten dollars you know it's not like he probably couldn't afford the five or ten dollars but it's the principle of the matter it's the principle that that we can sit up here and and I'm just gonna say we can sit up here and we can approve fifty thousand dollar consulting and whether that consultants worth every penny I'm not saying it's not because there's that's a different you're comparing apples to apples but we can do that and then we'll sit here and talk about ten and five dollar something for the community I just I mean, I just want to remind the council that as we go into this budget cycle, it's going to be really, really tough. We're going to be making some super tough decisions. But I think we need to remind ourselves that kids are going to be, that their kids are first, and we need to try to fight for these programs that is just the, the tiniest little bit of, you know, something that, you know, our community can use and, 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 and uh, put their kids into. And I mean, there's just so many more things. I, I think we need to all really think on that really hard when it comes time to make those decisions because um, I'm, I personally am going to fight hard for this stuff. And um, so. And you know, especially about uh, uh, that youth program, if as a, you know, we can three widget that uh, fees, if as a council agree or we want to move forward. Thank you. Is that a motion? No. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Skinner, did you want to make a quick comment? Do you want to can you please come to the? Um, I'm, 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 I'm be honest, with you, sir. I'm not trying to. I, I understand you take your job personal. I really do. I would never want to offend you in any any shape or fashion. Just quick question, um, as far as a comment. <clears throat> I know Parks and Rec is supposed to subsidize the fees that we're not making as far as adequacy compared to around us. We might be losing money. Um, but I just want us to remember also facilities, how our facilities are looking compared to around us, why the fees are more expensive around us. For instance, I try to save Parks and Rec's money. You go, basketball fees are going up. Another subject. You look at our schools. There are electrical plates sticking up at least an inch and a half off the ground. That will cost us a lot of money, millions of dollars to sue. And trust me, parents will sue you. You know they will if you hurt their kid. I'm just asking us to be smart. That's all I want. Um, don't, don't take away from the kids. That's all I want to. I mean, there's a lot of kids, like Mr. Farmer said, is a lot of kids will never play sports again. A lot of parents are single parents out there trying to struggle. We give them rides as volunteer coaches, things of that nature. If we, if we increase the fees, what are they going to do? 
I mean, I'm being very honest with you. What are they, what are they going to do? They're going to sit at home, play video games, most likely get in trouble, and end up seeing this gentleman, probably. That's what, not, not what we need. That's not what we need. We're a small town. We could be better than this. We could be stronger than this. We have to be smart. That's just, I'm, like I said, I'm not trying to criticize this gentleman. He has a hard job. I'm sure he does. I just wish that we would honestly look outside the bounds and be a little more open-minded to say, okay, yeah, it might be 135 here or Lodi, but the facilities are a lot nicer, bathrooms are clean, things are open to the public, things are getting better. That's why people will pay those prices. No one's going to pay those prices here if things do not get better. And we will lose it. And we'll have no jobs. I have no one to talk to. So I, I, just, I just, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And just please also accept all the sports, basketball, they're all going up tremendously. And it's just, it's not right. We really have another way to make money. So thank you. Mr. Skinner, I just have a couple of comments. Um, and, I, and I really am not one to like to compare our community to other communities. I know we do it because we have to benchmark yeah. uh, just for, for pricing. But I will tell you this, in the community north of us, those um, kids pay like, if the leagues pay like 15 to $20 per player for a full year for field usage. Now, those fields aren't in the shape that they're in up there because of youth sports providing money to the organization. The reason they're in the condition they're in is because the youth sports organizations go above and beyond and do field maintenance on their own during their season to make them nicer. And so that's earlier when I was asking, um, has there ever been a nonprofit youth sports organization running softball? Um, there hasn't. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I think our Parks and Rec staff do an awesome job for what we have. Um, I think they have put a lot of work into this report. Um, I appreciate Armando, you and your staff. Um, I dealt as a nonprofit board member uh, of a youth sports organization. I dealt with parents and coaches, and it's a tough job. Uh, but on the other hand, we really need to look at what we want as a community. And the folks that are here in the room tonight that are part of youth sports organizations or um, their, their children play in our recreation programs, it's really up to you what you want. So think about that as we move forward. Um, if we want to improve things, that you can't always look to, to the government to help improve things, you know? I mean, we've got uh, an awesome opportunity with all the folks in the room tonight to, to help move that forward. Um, I, would, I would suggest, and I'm a, I'll let Mr. Sandu speak again, because I think he wants to speak. Oh, you're good. Um, I, I would make a, uh, a motion that we not increase uh, any of the youth sports um, fees for this year, um, but next year, if we need to, um, I, I would be prepared to take another look at that. And so uh, my motion would be uh, the youth sports programs. Um, which, which ones uh, specifically? Uh, youth softball and base t-ball registration, um, youth basketball. Are, but do the same issues apply in basketball? See, I, I'm not. I think they do. Schools might be raising the prices too. Well, I, but my concern is, is that you know we the, the, there are ongoing costs. Like Armando has said, we have ongoing costs in terms of salary increases, maintenance, operation. We have a declining revenue from the flea market. It's being subsidized to the tune of you know millions of dollars. So I I have a. You know, not to pick on any particular uh, uh, program in the city, I just think that you know it's prudent to look at where we are financially. Um, I, I don't know that you know a five dollar increase will make that big a difference. Some of these rates are not increasing at all, so that motion actually does nothing, um, in, in my opinion. I uh, I have a hard time trying to reconcile, not trying to at least stay up with what our actual costs are in terms of salaries for these employees to run the program when we already significantly subsidize them. Mm -hmm. That is my concern. And uh, I, I, I certainly agree with what you say, Rich, in terms of having you know nonprofit organizations assist, and that is big in other communities, and I think it could make a, a huge difference in this community. 
but I don't know that I'm willing to simply um, not look at a very reasonable adjustment uh, to an already subsidized system. So. Okay. Can I ask a question, sir? I'm sorry. I, I know it's probably past my time, but then would we? Would you rather be in favor of cutting the programs from the kids? Just and because this. this I didn't say happen. cut the programs. I understand, but I'm just saying, sir. We've all known about this $15 wage increase for the past five years. And for us to use that as a crutch is pretty pathetic, I'll be very honest with you, because you guys, businessmen here, businessmen, they're prepared to run their business. They knew this increase was coming. For us to keep on using that as an excuse of why we have to increase it, we should have been planning. No, I, that, it's, it's not a crutch, it, it, it's a fact. I understand. And, and it's being phased in over so time, and those, those, those costs are increasing annually to the city. So all this is doing is trying to keep up with what some of those costs are. Not all costs are included here, as, as Mr. Uh, uh, as Armando has indicated. So I, I don't think it's a crutch. In, in the city has recognized that there have been increased costs. They have not ignored that. Um, and, and taking this type of action is what does address that um, on, a, on a regular basis. I mean, the city does this on an annual basis. They evaluate what those costs are. They look at the CPI and they look at other reasonable adjustments. So I don't think it's it's fair to to indicate that you know we're using it as a crutch or have ignored it. Well, that's all I hear. I'm sorry. That's why I keep on. Hearing. Well, again, if you if you come to the meetings or if you look at what the past budgets were or what the f past increases were on the fees, then you would see that no, the city has not ignored this. They've actually taken steps to look at it in a progressive manner. Okay, and line of the, in lieu of the flea market. That's not making money, so we're going to keep on running that route. As we it, it still makes money. It doesn't make as much money as it used to. I mean, that's really kind of getting off topic yes, here. Yeah, I mean, but it, it has. And, 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 you know, the, 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 that, that whole uh, venue uh, with Internet sales has changed. Changed the, the retail landscape, not only for the flea market, but for any uh, brick-and-mortar uh, retailer. I mean, you look at that. I mean, those are, those are much bigger things than just that it's losing money. I mean, there are, there are factors here that uh, uh, are very complex, quite frankly. Yeah, uh, well, I, I hope our city learns to adapt and change with those. Like yes, said, so. I agree. Armando, I have two questions for you. Can you explain the, the relationship between Galt Youth Baseball? Because that's kind of in line with what Rich is talking about. What's, tell, explain to the, to the public in here, what's the arrangement with Galt Youth Baseball and, and how it pertains to Harvey Park and what they do and what the city does and allows them to do? So it, it's still it's the same arrangement that we have with the other uh, youth groups, uh, County Line Youth Soccer, or excuse me, County Line Youth Soccer, uh, Galt Football Club, uh, Junior Hawks, Junior Warriors. There's a ten dollar per player fee program where um, each one of the kids pays ten dollars to participate in that program for the year. That money goes into uh, maintenance um, operations that we can't fund our nor normal maintenance from it has to be extra maintenance for that. Uh, for that fee, they get uh, free use of all the, all the facilities. Um, they get a reduced cost at, for lights. Um, but Galt Youth Baseball is probably the best example of a group that contributes to the city's facilities. Uh, they recently have redone the infield at Harvey Park, the two fields at uh, uh, Meadowview Park. Uh, they've put in a lot of money into the shade structures. I mean, they're, they're the primary users, yes, but they've also improved our parks by doing so. Uh, they've saved us quite a bit of money by, by uh, volunteer coaches coming out and maintaining the fields. They have a certain standard that they, they hold those fields, um, but they're also giving priority over everybody else to use those fields. Speaking of priority, I know there was a little bit of complaint about some of the championship games for the youth sports having to be played at McCaffrey and because of tournaments. And I know weather caused some overlap in schedules, but I think one bitter pill that I'm hearing a lot of is, you know, that schedules are bumped around and out of town tournaments. Mr. Mayor, I, I think we need to stay on topic. Yeah, we're supposed to be talking on about topic the is, the, is the fee schedule, not, 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 not the programs. We're talking about the programs. Well, uh -uh. no, we're talking about fees associated. With Excuse the me, but I'm talking, and I would like a, like to have that time Sean, to talk. But, but it's not an agendized item. What's not an agendized item that we're talking about? He, Help me. We had a public comment that spoke about the fee program and what we're getting for those fees. I'm talking about what we're getting for those fees. No, you're talking about switching things around. People got moved around. Yeah, which is me. What we're getting for those fees? 
what is he getting for his $75 for his kid? He's getting schedules that are bumped around. He's getting emails in the morning that says, oh, by the way, your game's not tonight, it's tomorrow morning. They're getting less than 24 hours notice. This is what I'm talking about, what they're getting yeah. for their money. I just think we're getting buried in minutia on, on things that, uh, this is a bigger issue. I make, a, I, I make a motion that we, we pass the schedule fee with the exception of all the youth sports. The adult sports can be raised according to the schedule, but everything that has to do with youth I make a motion that we leave it exactly the way it is right now. Um, just to step in, sorry, were you? Um, I do believe mm -hmm. we had a motion on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think it might be worthwhile to clarify what the initial motion was, because I think it sounds like they might be similar. I also have a recommendation that um, the way that it's currently presented to you in the agenda, there's a resolution. Um, the resolution can be adopted as is, but to the extent that a motion is proposing to amend any specific fees, I would recommend that we be very specific about um, the amendments to Exhibit A to the <coughs> resolution that will be adopted um, and point out specifically, if you can, um, perhaps by the page number and then the specific category um, that you propose not being raised or amended, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. State <coughs> Manager. Uh, Mayor Lampson, members of the council, the other thing I would just uh, suggest is as you identify those uh, specific uh, youth related fees that you wouldn't want to raise that uh, perhaps it would at least be prudent for the council to acknowledge that that um, for th those wouldn't be raised for the time being as the council's aware uh, the city does have a very significant uh, financial uh, deficit a structural deficit that it needs to resolve and that the council has agreed with uh, previous recommendation and directed us to uh, work through a, a, a schedule of reviewing uh, the affected funds that give rise to that structural deficit, one of which is the Culture and Recreation Fund. And so uh, <clears throat> as we seek to find resolution to our structural deficit, I think that it will be important to be able to look at all of the areas of both expenditure and potential revenue so that you can be making a holistic decision later this summer uh, as to what you're going to do with respect to cuts and what you're going to do with respect to revenues. And all I'm really saying is that if later this summer, in, uh, by, by August when you're making decisions, you decide to return to this particular item, to raise these fees or to reconsider these fees, that you provide yourself the leeway to do so. Thank you. May, may I list out the youth programs that I've identified? I'm looking at youth t-ball softball registrations. I'm looking at youth ball, basketball. Um, now the question would be, do we raise the um, fees for the aquatic center for children or and the swim team the golf gators well the swim team is it's like 50 cents right for admission no that's the aquatics the aquatic I, center is going from 350 to four dollars for youth five to twelve um 250 to three dollars for toddlers and teens uh will stay at will go from four to five. So it's a 50 cent increase. And a dollar, dollar. dollar. The annual pass, is that going up or is that staying? Do well, that, $3? Would, that would bit. also be affected also. So depending on what, you, what you're what you giving us instruction to do, and then the Galt Gators is going from 150 to 160. I'm only referring to the youth t-ball, softball, and basketball. Okay. Not referring to the aquatics. All right. That's what I'm referring to. I don't think a 50% increase of admission or that is going to is significant enough. I just want to make sure we're clear on what Thank you. the recommendation is. You're so to the clarify motion. the motion, um, what I said earlier was um, to accept staff's recommendation with the exception of youth t-ball softball registration, which is on page 22 of 27. And then in addition, on page 23 of 27, youth basketball to keep those at the 2018-19 fee rate. That's your motion? Yes. I second. Okay, motion made by Councilmember Lozano, seconded by Vice Mayor Farmer. 
Do we need to? We all right, Ashley? I'm good. You're good? I got I'm good. It. Okay. We'll call vote. Vice Mayor Farmer? Aye. Council Member Sandu? Aye. Council Member Campion? No. Council Member Lozano? Aye. Mayor Lampson? Aye. Motion passes four to one. All right. Approve the proposed capital improvement program. So one minor comment on, on the action that was just taken. Those fees are part of the budget we're going to talk about in a little bit. So we may be coming back to you later with an amendment to the budget. But I'm going to go ahead and proceed as though those dollars are still there. Okay. But um, first, let's talk about capital improvement program. So capital improvement program, this is a five-year program um, for the city's anticipated capital projects. Um, capital projects are construction projects or capital equipment costing 30,000 or more with a useful life of at least five years. The budgets for these projects do not include staff salary costs. Um, the city CIP document also includes costs beyond the five-year time frame for planning purposes. Um, the majority of the budget changes are being proposed for 1819 in this plan are from rollover of funding. In other words, most of these projects are multi-year, so um, some of the money is uh, rolling over into 1819. We also have some increases um, in that year um, for uh, budget appropriations for projects with newly all allocated funds from state funds and water plant <coughs> improvement. Um, monies. So we did this little schedule, basically the, the biggest items. I'm not going to go through them in much detail, but um, basically uh, the capital projects uh, span multiple fiscal years and um, the budget of this plan is really for the two years you see up there. So we've kind of focused in on what the budget changes, the, big, the significant ones are for 1819 and for 1920. <coughs> Excuse me, when looking uh, through the projects, um, there are several projects that have minor revisions, so you'll see them in your documents, but these are the larger ones. Um, Fourth Street project was completed ahead of schedule, so there's an increase to 1819 and a decrease to 1920. Um, the total cost of that project, because it did start earlier, was 369, almost 370,000. Um, the transportation funds are allocated for two projects you see up there, Transit o Operation Maintenance Center and the Pavement Project. Um, there's Safe Routes to School Project, which is funded by grants and Measure A and a little bit of other money. Um, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation contract is uh, funding the firing range improvements. Um, Fees from contractors are being used to fund the industrial water production well, and the, and the park development fees are being released from the uh, Walker Park uh, project for future projects. Um, any questions about capital improvement? Yes, sir. I do. Uh, the park development fees, we've been over this before, but that's uh, a fund that's not being touched right now. That's just sitting there waiting for the ability to either add to it or maintain the improvements. So, Walker Park. Do we have other um, money projects scheduled out of this money at this point? No, my understanding is it's only for new park facilities. So, there's none at this time. Okay. Yeah, the, the money is not able to be used for any maintenance. Right. And I guess, the, I guess the question is more, how far off are we from having the money to develop the next phase? And I, and I ask that understanding that we probably don't have the money to maintain it yet. Correct. But if we did, how far off are we? Yes, sir. <laughs> Council. Um, we have a, approximate, I think the last time I looked, just around $4 million in, in park capital fees that we have there. Um, we are, we have money to do parts of the f 
phase two of Walker Park, and and but it's just how are we going to maintain those facilities? You know, if we put in a new ball field, we have the money to do a new ball field. We have new money. We have money to do a, a, a parking lot. But how are we going to maintain those facilities? And that's where we're at right now, is that we have money to do something, but no money to maintain it because of our budget uncertainties. So the three hundred fifty-seven thousand that we have there is enough to build the next phase. We no, no, that's not. Okay. That's not correct. How how that was going to go for a some restrooms and some overflow parking lot. Okay. Um, and uh, that was just a portion of it. <coughs> okay. All right. The next phase. Thank you. Can I open the public hearing? Any discussion? We do need a parking lot out there. Is there any public comment on the capital improvement plan? Any more council discussion? Okay. Close public hearing. Okay. Can I get a motion to receive the presentation? Open public hearing. Da, 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 da. Adopt a resolution approving the proposed capital improvement program update for fiscal year 2018 19 through 2022 20, to 23 and appropriating funds for the midterm review and budget appropriations to projects in fiscal years 2018 19 and 2019 20. Moved. Second. Motion made by Councilmember Campion, seconded by Councilmember Lozano. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Farmer. Aye. Councilmember Sandu. Aye. Councilmember Campion. Aye. Councilmember Lozano. Aye. Mayor Lamson. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Now we have a presentation on. There's more. There's more. So before you, on your next item is the budget itself and the adjustments to the budget. Um, in addition to the master fee schedule update and the modified CIP, the operating budgets have been reviewed for all funds with the following proposed modifications. Citywide expenditures um, are, are recommended to increase by a net of 1.6 million. Um, part of that, a big chunk of that is encumbrances carried over from a prior year that we have to appropriate in the current year. Um, grant funds, special revenue spending, so additional spending that has a corresponding revenue. Um, council has already approved in March uh, 405,000 for the patrol vehicles. Um, personnel costs um, are being reduced by 292,000 citywide. Um, this is really a net effect of the increased MOU that the council has already approved. Um, and some adjustments for new hires, along with vacancy savings that's primarily PD applied to uh, Measure R. In addition, expenditures have been reduced by 153,000 um, due to California Department of Finance, um, their evaluation of the ROPS for successor agency. This is really activity that's passed through, passed through to Kasumna's Community Services District per the settlement agreement. The revenues are increasing by one point, almost 1.2 million. Um, these are mostly related to general fund increases, which I'll talk about in a minute, and um, the addition of one-time developer reimbursement received for Northeast Lighting and Landscape District of 281,000. <coughs> So that was for 1819. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about 1920. Um, the biggest increase ex to expenditures is for additional costs made possible by the new refuse contract. Some of the cost increases or rate increases passed onto the market um, for refuse and other city operations. In addition, the city remittance amount paid to Cal Waste are anticipated to increase for the collection of residential waste bills processed by the city. Um, revenue increases, 134,000. Um, the, these are minor net adjustments. Um, they're including uh, offsetting increases to refuse and capital and decreases um, for slower than originally anticipated building activities. This slide is really just a summary of what I um, described and the net impact 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, for fiscal year 18-19, the net um, increase is uh, almost 60,000, and for 19-20, the increase is 588,000. And there's some items in there that, um, that are basically a summary of what I just discussed. So I want to talk a little bit about general fund. Um, the focus of is general fund is used for the operation of services primarily. Um, and um, the revenue uh, significant increases are listed here. Um, 1.4 million are the expenditures. Again, those are primarily from encumbrances carried over from the prior year. 611,000 labor agreements, MOU. Now this is an increase. Um, citywide it became a decrease because of vacancy savings, but for the general fund it is an increase of 185,000 and then grant spending for PEG energy grant and others, um, an increase of 283. The revenue increase is 869. Um, carryover of grants, again, 177. <coughs> Additional grant funding, so the PEG grant, energy, community block grant, um, 377. And then we do have some increases to taxes and fees here of 269,000. For the 1920 year, the expenditure increases are 360,000, primarily from labor agreement MOUs, 110, and then uh, paid grant spending. Um, revenue increases are 153,000. Um, although there is some grant activity in here, there's also property tax um, increases. And those are just the most significant items. Um, this again is a summary of the general fund for 1819. You see the revenue increases, less the carryover, expenditure increases. The, the net impact is about 53,000 increase for 1819. And then in 1920, the increase is, the net increase is 207,000. So presented here is a visual presentation of the sources of general fund revenue. So most of our revenue is coming from property tax, 48%, sales tax, 24%, other taxes, um, license permits, charges for services, um, investment earnings. I always put the investment earnings in for Sean, um, the treasurer Sean, um, and miscellaneous income. On the expenditure side, um, this pie chart shows um, how the money is being spent on what services. So police services, 47%, public works, which is the maintenance of the buildings and um, the facilities, uh, 15%, central services, 26%, city offices, and community development. By category, so by expenditure category, this slide shows the same monies, but um, what we spend it on. We are a service organization. We spend primarily most of our money on personnel. Um, there is, a, so that's 71% operation maintenance, 27, and very little on capital, minor capital and CIP. <coughs> I'm going to slow down just a little bit. That was general fund and citywide. Now I'm going to go on to Parks and Rec. We're good? Okay. So Parks and Rec, I did kind of a more summarized here because basically it, it, there's not a lot of change. Um, the changes are an increase in 1819 of 78,000 and a decrease in um, 1920 of 114,000. So a lot of work being done to do we analyze all of these funds? Absolutely. Um, we've been on a three, four year um, adventure in budget cutting and um, some of it's being realized here. So then we did the same kind of pie charts for Parks and Rec. Where does the money revenue come from? Um, Galt Market, 
77 percent, um, recreation 12 percent, aquatic center 6, parks 4, and miscellaneous 1. <coughs> How is the money spent? Basically, what kind of activities do we spend our money on? Um, the majority of it is spent on the market, um, and then parks has a sizable amount of 25%, 23%, um, and recreation is up there at 17% with the aquatic center and miscellaneous. Again, we're a service organization, so um, personnel <coughs> costs dominate the costs, although for Parks and Rec, it's a lesser percentage, primarily because of all the heavy use of hourly staff. Any questions on Parks and Rec? I have one question. Yes, sir. Um, on the pie graph for the revenue, uh -huh. um, what piece of that pie would represent the contribution from the general fund? It is not on that chart. So these are just um, the actual revenues coming in. It does not include that contribution from general fund. Okay, so this doesn't, so this graph doesn't represent 100%, or I mean it does by the percentages though. Well, it's 100% of the revenue that comes in, okay. except for gotcha. that transfer. So Claire, I had a, a quick question on um, the general fund where the money comes from. We're at 24% sales tax. Is that, in some of the cities you've worked in, is that low or high or average? It's fairly low. There's certain um, uh, documentation that comes out of the state. Um, they do a per capita, they do, um, you name it, they, they give a lot of information. And um, um, I don't have the documents in front of me, I can bring them to you at a later time, but our per capita is really, really low. And um, what we receive in sales tax, partly because of a lack of businesses and partly because of our rate. Um, it's, it's fairly fairly low compared to most. Um, I can bring you more information if you'd like about surrounding areas, what their percentage is. Um, uh, it's, it's not every city gives this kind of information in their public um, presentation. Um, so I can't give all of the cities in the county, but um, I've looked at a few in this county, Sacramento, and in surrounding areas. We're Probably because we're, it goes on with some of the presentations where we're bleeding sales tax to other residents or shopping other places. Part of it is that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So just seventy. So basically, said roughly seventy-five percent of our revenue comes from taxes of some sort. Actually, I'm sorry. More than that. More than Were that. the other taxes? Would that represent like TOT tax and mm -hmm. other Correct. various? Mm -hmm. So roughly between businesses and let's say hotels and other types of businesses that generate tax, we're like at 36%, right? I can barely read that. Plus 40, plus the 48. Yeah, but I mean, not including the property. I mean, I'm just talking like business tax, taxes mm -hmm. that businesses generate like hotels and- 36. Mm -hmm. So then taking all of that data and putting it into a table with numbers, um, this table is the general fund summary. It basically is showing the fund balance um, and the impacts of the activities we just talked about. So the top section separates out non-spendable items such as prepaid and inventories, restricted amounts per council reserve policy, and the trip of prior year negative fund balances. The bottom section shows the results of 1819 and the results of 1920 per the proposed budget. And the um, what this table shows is how much our normal operating activities are using of our general fund reserve. This, this this will be the um, topic of um, more discussions. Right, so council recall that at our May 15th meeting, this was the chart that I 
really asked you to to take a look at and 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 study it. Uh, uh, and I suggested to you that if there was any slide in this presentation that should give you and the community pause for concern, it would be this one. Uh, you see that at the end of fiscal year, in the first column of numbers where it says fiscal year 2018-19, uh, we're taking the available fund balance of $4.8 million uh, down to about $2.4 million. And then in next fiscal year, if we don't, change our ways, uh, we, we, we take the available fund balance of $2.4 million uh, down to $777,000. And uh, <clears throat> as I uh, indicated to you when you asked me to uh, take on this role as the interim city manager, I'd uh, just tell you the way it was. That's the way it is. And if you, uh, as a council, fail to act, uh, the city will be in a very significant financial crisis. And so we, as the mayor indicated, or as, uh, uh, maybe it was just Claire, we have a lot of work to do this summer, and we will need to take and make very, uh, very hard decisions, certainly much harder decisions than uh, uh, were, were uh, made tonight. This is a similar schedule for Parks and Rec. It basically takes um, what, uh, what occurred in the prior fiscal year, trues it up. Um, these are contributions coming from the general fund. They correspond to the schedule before this, along with the 1819 impact and the 1920 impact. So the, the most, um, uh, there is a line there for contribution from general fund, 1.4 million and 1.2 million. So that 303 million of revenue, that includes what we just waived for the 20, 1920? There would be an adjustment for that okay. in 1920, reducing that downward. Okay. Taking all of that data and massaging it into the your long-range financial plan, um, because of minor adjustments to the related budgets, the graph kind of looks similar to what you've seen before. Um, the uh, blue line being general fund without any contributions being made to anything else. Parks and Rec is the green line at the bottom. Um, Lighting and landscape is the yellow line, orange yellow, and the dotted line is the combination of all of those. This chart is really the same information, only what it's doing is it's layering in your reserves. So the green portion is your economic uncertainty reserve, that's by council policy. Your um, yellow is, or excuse me, the blue is other reserves, so the prepaids, et cetera. And then, um, the available fund balance is the yellow. So what this indicates is, you know, pictorially, that by 1920, you're pretty much out of available fund balance. And as we go through the subsequent years in the path we're on right now, um, we will be negative by 2024. Well, but, I mean, you have this label as economic uncertainty reserve isn't in fact we will be cutting services yes if I mean, you, you 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 can't maintain the level of service we have today with a decline in revenue that you're showing and ha and have no savings in your account it, it would be unwise to do so unwise i don't know that it's possible <laughs> Claire, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, on the um, on the slide, Parks and Recreation Fund Summary, the list of the cost. Yeah, that one. So why is it that the uh, general fund contribution goes down by 225000 <laughs> Do you, Do you want to talk about the increased fees again, Armando? Mm -hmm. That was the increased fees. Um, I think it's a combination of things, but there are increased fees included in that. And so some of it is that. Some of it is just prudent spending. Um, we've, we've really 
particularly Armando's team and the budget team has really kind of hammered out a lot um, and tried to kind of squeeze every dime out of what they can budget. For the 18, 19 year, um, a lot of those costs have already been expended. So, you know, we, we know we had certain kinds of one-time costs that are embedded in there that are probably not included at all in the 1920. So, did you have anything to add to that, Armando? So with that, um, the structural deficits in the LLDs and in Parks and Rec will need to be resolved um, to maintain the appropriate re reserve over time. Um, staff will, will be reviewing operations, are already in the process of that. Um, operations that impact particularly general fund Parks and Rec and LLDs to develop options by August, <coughs> excuse me, um, options involving expenditure service cuts along with revenue enhancements will be provided to council in September for direction and action. Um, with that, if there are no further questions. We open the, open the public hearing. Any more discussion from council? Any public comment? Close the public hearing. All right. Can I get a adopt a resolution approving the fiscal years 2018, 2019, and 2019, 2020 annual budget with appropriations for midterm budget adjustments and approving fiscal year 2019-20 California constitutional appropriations limit. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion. Second. Made by Councilmember Lozano, seconded by Councilmember Campion. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Farmer. Aye. Councilmember Sandu. Aye. Councilmember Campion. Aye. Councilmember Lozano. Aye. Mayor Lamson. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you, Claire, for your marathon there. All right, next up interim human resources director appointments. City Manager Hagman. Mayor Lampson, members of the council, as you are aware, our uh, current human resources director, Cora Hall, the esteemed Cora Hall, has uh, accepted uh, employment at a, uh, another agency. It's uh, quite a good move for, uh, for, for Cora and uh, uh, not, not such a good move for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, nonetheless, we, uh, we certainly wish Cora well and we thank her for all her service to the city and all she's done. Uh, in the meantime, as we uh, uh, conduct a recruitment for replacement uh, human resources director, uh, I believe it necessary to uh, re reach out and uh, bring in an interim human resources director that can uh, pick up uh, the, uh, the, the, the various, or, or keep spinning, I guess, the various plates that that Cora has uh, in the air. And uh, <clears throat> we reached out to uh, the human resource professionals uh, in the Northern California a uh, area, uh, taking, uh, seeking uh, input or any advice on uh, potential retired annuitants that have uh, the, the level of human resource experience uh, that that uh, uh, at least Cora has, or that we need for uh, for our agency. We also took a look at uh, bringing in a consultant or a consulting firm, someone from a consulting firm. Uh, but with respect to uh, what we need uh, in human resources, we've determined that a consulting firm's uh, scope and focus would have to be far too narrow. Uh, and that we would be better served by someone with the requisite experience uh, that uh, uh, is, is currently uh, retired from service as a HR director. Now, the types of things that I'm talking about that, that human resources, uh, uh, that, that you want in a human resources director is someone that's well steeped in public sector labor law. 
uh, well steeped in uh, uh, labor unit representation or, or working with the with the various labor units. Uh, there are always issues uh, that, that come up with respect to your, your various memoranda of understanding with your various uh, uh, labor units. Uh, workers' compensation, uh, I as well as in this city, the HR director wears the risk manager hat and serves on the board of the uh, risk management authority uh, to which we, we belong. Uh, and, and so the uh, uh, outreach effort uh, yielded uh, the, uh, an individual, a retired annuitant by the name of Joanne Narlock. Uh, Joanne Narlock uh, happens to also be an attorney uh, she is retired. She served uh, for uh, many years as the uh, Human Resources Director in the city of Lodi, has other experiences as listed in the staff report. We consulted both with uh, her previous employers when she was uh, a full-time employee, as well as those agencies for which Ms. Narlock uh, served as an interim human resources director and those uh, references uh, yielded very positive uh, uh, comments. And so uh, because this is the employment uh, of a retired annuitant, uh, we do need the council to adopt a resolution uh, appointing her as a retired annuitant. This is just a, uh, wouldn't be uh, usual or customary, uh, but it is uh, with respect to retired annuitants under uh, the PEARL, the Public Employee Retirement Law. And so with that explanation, I'm happy to answer uh, any uh, questions that the council may have and uh, uh, commend to you our recommendation that you uh, uh, approve the uh, 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 employment temporary employment agreement of Ms. Norlock uh, as well as re the resolution. Be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Tom. So, just roughly, what's what what kind of savings are we talking about by having a retired annuitant versus filling the position right now because of the benefits? Th that's a that's a very good question. And under uh, the, uh, the the government code, uh, we are required to pay the hourly rate uh, that the outgoing incumbent received uh, to the incoming retired annuitant, but. Uh, it stops there. Uh, the retired annuitant cannot earn any uh, sort of employment benefit uh, to include vacation or sick leave or health care or any other uh, type of benefit that a uh, employee would otherwise earn. So uh, she will be earning as it uh, identifies the, uh, the uh, rate of pay, hourly rate of the outgoing uh, human resources director of that position. Right. Thank you. Any other discussion? Sounds like a, a very competent person coming in. All right. Can I get a motion? So moved. Do I have to, do I have to read it? Motion to oh, um, appointing Joanne M. Narlock Esquire as an interim human resource director effective June 17th, 2019, and authorizing the city manager to execute an agreement for the temporary employment with Ms. Narlock. Can I get a second? I'll do second. All right. Motion made by Councilmember Lozano, seconded by Councilmember Sandu. Roll call vote. Vice Mayor Farmer? Aye. Councilmember Sandu? Aye. Councilmember Campion? Aye. Councilmember Lozano? Aye. Mayor Lamson? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Community Development Department, the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan Implementing Agreement Amendment, Plan Amendment, and Mitigation Fee Schedule. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Again, Chris Rice, Community Development Director. As mentioned, the item you have before you is an amendment to the South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan, or SSHCP, and amendments to the accompanying implementing agreement and mitigation fee schedule. The City Council adopted the SSHCP and its associated components in October of last year. The SSHCP is a regional effort that provides development and infrastructure projects with a streamlined, predictable federal and state permitting process and also mitigation fees while creating a preserve system to protect habitat, open space, and agricultural lands. 
The HCP provides a more effective process for protecting natural resources as compared to the previous process of a project-by-project project, uh, mitigation that often resulted in small and isolated preserves. The HCP will ensure the creation of a large interconnected preserves that are sustained in perpetuity by an adequately funded management program. Other agencies participating in the plan include Sacramento County, uh, Sac Regional County Sanitation District, the Sacramento County Water Agency, Capital Southeast Connector JPA, and the City of Rancho Cordova. A component of the adopted plan is an implementing agreement for the Habitat Conservation Plan. It clarifies the provisions of the SSHCP and the processes that ensure successful implementation of the plan in accordance with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, incident, incidental take permit requirements, and applicable law. Mm. Uh, most of the revisions to the implementing agreement are minor edits and clarifications that are shown in the revised implementing agreement track changes document. A more significant revision to the agreement included removing the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, or CDFW, as a party to the agreement. Since the implementing agreement is not related to any actions by CDFW, uh, it was recommended that they be removed. Also, language in the implementing agreement related to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act has been deleted. It's been removed because the current interpretation of the act does not prohibit incidental take of migratory birds. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service has indicated that the language in the agreement needs to be consistent with the current interpretation of the act. The, HC, the SSHCP plan amendment includes changes to the JPA agreement, changing the composition of the governing board from six members to seven, which includes an additional elected official uh, from Sac County. The JPA board is now comprised of four Sac County board members, up from the three, two council members from Rancho Cordova, and one city of Galt representative, currently filled by council member Campion, and then uh, as an alternate, Mayor uh, Lampson. Another amendment to the implement is that the implementing committee has been revised to implementation review committee. And this implementation review committee assists and advises the JPA board on matters related to the HCP. Uh, the members of it have been revised from five to seven, including a member from the city of Galt, Sac County, Rancho Cordova, two representatives from the agricultural community, and one representative from the environmental community, as well as a representative from the business community. The final request it is amendment to the fee schedule. Uh, the approved fees were based on 2015 rates, and again, that was approved by council and the other plan partners in 2018. So the revised fees reflect a CPI increase since, 25, since 2015, which represents a 9.5 percent increase from uh, the 2015 rates that were uh, approved in 2018. So development projects and infrastructure projects have to mitigate their biology impact fees, so they pay this fee, and the city of Galt will be uh, uh, take applications for these mitigation fees and then pass them through to the SSHCP. Uh, Kim Hudson, uh, the executive director with the SSHCP, is here. I wanted to introduce her, and I think she could give a little bit of background on the HCP as well as perhaps an update. Um, this is a, a new program, and so we're, we're all kind of learning as we're going on the actual operation, and Kim has been great in helping us because one of the disadvantages for a small city, which we talked about in the use of consultants, is uh, having the expertise to handle certain topics and biology is a specialized field so having him with the uh, with the habitat conservation plan help us is a is a is great for our department so kim <laughs> okay well i'll be brief it's getting late i'm kim hudson i am the executive director of the south sacramento conservation agency um, this is a plan that's been in the works for over 20 years um, and well, the plan, there's a lot of moving pieces to this plan, and I'm not going to go over all that tonight because we'd be here for hours. But um, since the plan was adopted, um, there's been a lot of progress on getting the permits in place. Um, one of the key aspects to getting the permits in place, especially from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, is this revised implementing agreement, 
once that's fully executed, we will be, the permit has already been issued. It's just been issued pending the full execution of this implementing agreement. So once that's signed and executed, we will have our permit from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is a really monumental step forward in this plan adoption. Um, so that's one of the items that's before you. Um, I don't know, that Chris covered it so well, I don't have very much more to say. Um, the uh, changes to the implementing agreement were from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They requested that those changes be made. Um, and uh, I think that's really all I have. Um, so we'd be available. Any questions yeah. for me? I'm, I, I will say that one of the uh, duties of the agency itself is to assist the plan permittees through this process. So um, Chris is going to be welcome to call me and meet with me on projects, and, and I can work with Chris, and that's part of my duties as the executive uh, officer for that, executive director for the agency. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We really appreciate you coming down and sitting through that. I would have pulled sure. you forward if I would have known. Oh, no, it's not, it's not take a problem. Two and a half hours, so. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we appreciate you guys. I know Kurt's on the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we, the actually, the board uh, took an action was a uh, last meeting is right. we, we approved this, what you have before you tonight. So. Okay. Any other council members? All right. Well, thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. All right. Let's see if we can get a resolution authorizing or a motion the, the mayor to execute the revised implementing agreement for the habitation conservation plan for South Sacramento County, approving South Sacramento Habitat Conservation Plan amendments to Chapter 9 implementation, and approving the SSHCP mitigation fee schedule. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Moved by Councilmember Campion, seconded by Councilmember Lozano. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Farmer. Aye. Councilmember Sandu. Aye. Councilmember Campion. Aye. Councilmember Lozano. Aye. Mayor Lampson. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Congratulations, Mr. Rice. All right. Any communication? Mm. Not tonight. <coughs> City Clerk's report? Nothing tonight. Comments by staff? Let's see. Nothing for me. <laughs> All right, Mr. Selling. I'll just briefly applaud the uh, HCP having come from San Joaquin County where we have one. It is a win-win for development as well as the preserves, so that's a good thing. Okay, wonderful. Director Arias. Uh, nothing further. <laughs> <laughs> How many more meetings do we have, Ms. Cora? This is it. Oh. Mm. We don't have cupcakes. Cake or something. Going out with a bang. <laughs> oh, we're going to miss you. I'm going to miss you, too. I'm going to cry. Okay, go ahead. I'll cry. Um, so we're currently recruiting for the positions of a city manager, human resources director, police officer, wastewater system operator, water conservation officer, and youth sports official for softball. So I encourage anyone who's interested to go to our website and apply. Thank you. Director Solis, you've had a few meetings where you haven't had to speak much, and it was... <laughs> Um, I do have a couple of things. Wanted to make you aware of some special events coming up in June. We have the Taste of the Market this uh, Sunday. Uh, it's from 8 to 3. We have about 75 vendors. We'll have music. We'll have food. Um, it's, a, it's a great thing for the community here that's usually at work to come in and see what the market is on a very smaller scale. So I encourage you guys to come or, and let, get the word out. Uh, we have the Galt Safety Expo on uh, the 22nd. On the 23rd, Sacramento County Dog and Cat Wellness Clinic uh, will be at Harvey Park from 9 to 3. And then uh, don't forget our IDC is coming up uh, with the TON 5K run. So um, I encourage everybody to sign up now so they can get a T-shirt. And um, that'd be great to keep that tradition going and keep his memory alive. Um, I also have uh, some, it's a very busy week for me, so we have some meetings scheduled this week uh, for Prop 68. I brought this forward to you guys before. Talked, uh, discussed it, put together an ad hoc committee with some of our commissioners. And we're, we've identified four parks uh, to apply for these grants. They're non-matching grants, 100% uh, funded, um, so, uh, but they are competitive grants. Uh, and part of that um, is that they require us to have uh, meetings with the stakeholders of the neighborhoods that these parks uh, are located in. So we identified four areas that are qualified, and uh, Meadowview Park, We'll be meeting out there on Wednesday. 
uh, June 5th at 6 p.m. That's tomorrow. Thursday, we'll be meeting out at Harvey Park at 6 p.m. Friday, we'll be meeting at the Aquatic Center, and that'll include the skate park also. Um, and then Monday, we'll go out to Lions Oak Park. Um, again, this is, they want, uh, I believe it's uh, 3,000 um, or three acres per thousand or less for parks and a medium household of less than 51,000. So these areas here have met that criteria. And um, so we'll be going forward and asking uh, that um, um, what people want to see in their neighborhood parks. So, and then we'll put together a everything that they've asked for. We'll bring that to city council. We'll bring it to the Parks and Rec Commission first, then we'll bring it to the city council meeting July 17th, and then submit our grants before the August 5th deadline. So forgive me if I forgot what you were saying, but so who's going to the, who's going to these parks? Are you having a public meeting or are they- We're having a public meeting. Okay. We're, we've invited people through our Facebook pages, emails, uh, our neighborhood watches. Um, so we're, we're getting the words out that way. That's where I'm hearing a rumor. Some of the kids were like, "Are you getting us a new skate park?" Yeah. So <laughs> well, we encourage exciting. people. We encourage people to show up. Uh, I'm hearing from some of the other communities, and they're not getting a lot of turnout. So I'm hoping that we're a little different, and we'll get some some great input. Well, great, thank you. Can I just add one more thing? I'm sure. sorry. I just again, why we're not going on the northeast side of town or looking at other parks? They just don't meet the requirements to apply for that. So that that's these are identified and qualified so could you forward council that so we can share that too and we can post sure. it thank you it was part of the park and recreation commission meeting the last meeting you talked correct extensively about that yeah, yeah. exciting news chief sockman how are you doing great i have three things and they'll be quick uh, there's a coffee with a cop uh, this weekend saturday june 8th from uh, 10 to noon at the coffee shop on c street and then uh, I'll be out of the office until next Tuesday, so Lieutenant Count Oski will be in charge. And then finally, um, I just want to say publicly that I'm going to miss Cora. Very quickly, I'll echo uh, uh, Mike Selling's comments about the HCP. I too come from a county with a, that, that uh, went through the laborious effort of putting in place an HCP, and uh, it, it, it is, uh, at least in that county, uh, universally uh, uh, enjoyed by both the development community and those jurisdictions that were part of the HCP. I think it provides a lot of surety uh, of development to uh, developers, especially where you have these uh, types of biotic mitigations that, that may need to take place. And so I think overall it would be a very good thing for the city. And finally, I want to thank Cora for all her help and assistance to me uh, as, as well as the city. Uh, yeah, we've only known each other a short while, but you will be missed. Thank you. Ashley, thank you for being here. Anything? All right. <clears throat> Councilmember Campion. Oh, thank you. Councilmember Lozano. I just want to thank Cora for her uh, her service to the city. Also, we sh I think we should probably have had cake or something here. I don't. Seriously. Do we do that? We don't do that. Yes, we do that. Normally done. Oh. The mayor dropped the ball. I dropped the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Again. No, no cake. No flag. <laughs> <laughs> but in all budget, seriousness, budget Cora. Budget cuts are tough already. <laughs> Thank you for your service to the city and in your help with me uh, as I was onboarding. Uh, you know, talking about MOUs and all of that stuff. So you were real great help, and, and I'm sure your next agency will be, uh, uh, will we'll find it a benefit to have you there. So thank you. Donna, do you have anything? Donna? Donna, okay. Council Member Sandu? Uh, thank you for uh, your service, and uh, congratulations to your new venture. I also attended uh, yesterday uh, finally, the grand opening of ARCO uh, gas station uh, with the uh, staff members and the mayor. And uh, I, I believe, uh, you know, we can get some kind of sale tax uh, uh, to revenue the city. Thank you. Vice Mayor Farmer. Um, I wanted to mention that Mayor Lamson and I had the pleasure of speaking at the Memorial Day uh, at the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And it was a great turnout, 
a ton of people out there, and uh, it was an honor to speak on the two veterans that I spoke about, and Paige, you gave a great speech. Um, also, the um, I want to mention some comment, if there's nobody here anymore, but um, the comment about the enforcement of the garbage, you know, I had, I had emailed um, Chief Sockman and, and Public Works and um, our city manager about, you know, being cognizant of, I think, the upcoming problem we're going to have with people dumping their trash in other people's containers, because a lot of businesses are going to carts now instead of the lockable larger dumpsters, so there's no way to lock them unless you kind of rig up something on your own. So we've already had some businesses that are complaining that you know, their carts are in the alley and they're getting people's, people are throwing garbage in it. So I think with the, with the, uh, with the high, high real estate price of garbage cans right now, I think it's going to get worse. So um, anyways, they were receptive to that and we're looking into what enforcement can be done. So other than that, thank you um, for your service, Cora. And you're going to Tahoe, right? South Lake Tahoe? Mm -mm. El Dorado. El Dorado. That's right. <laughs> Is. Why would you pick that over Galt, really? <laughs> what do they got that we don't have? Money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah. But good luck. Um, yeah, we've, we had a few things. We had the, the chamber luncheon at Pastosa's. That was quite scrumptious. And it was so exciting to open um, AMPM last yesterday. Someone had every flavor of Slurpee. Um, but you literally have to be a rocket science to work the soda machine. The poor guy had to come over and show me how to work the soda machine. So go check it out. And as soon as we pulled the ribbons off the gas, people were pulling in. So get that sales tax going. And Cora, thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. And I know you came in and as a new person has to redo everything and make sure everything's all compliant. And just your patience with us and emailing us when we forget things and um, what happened to all this and giving it to me again. And I just appreciate your patience with the council, and we will miss you. Okay. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>